A Charming Ghost, Magical Cures Mystery Series, Volume 8, written by Tanya Kappas, narrated by Karen Savage. Chapter 1 I wasn't just cold. I was bone-numbing, toe-curling, potion-freezing cold, and no amount of snuggling with Oscar, and I tried, was going to drive out the chill that had crept up into my soul, deep into my soul. I reached over and grazed Madame Taurus, my crystal ball, with the pad of my finger. Her globe flashed red lightning bolts until it settled into a display that showed it was 4.30 in the morning. She wasn't about to show her face. My snarky crystal ball was not a morning person. I was sure it took hours for her to get all dolled up in her head turban and the gobs of makeup she wore, and lightning bolts were her subtle way of telling me she was not happy with the early morning wake-up call. I glanced over at Oscar, my husband of two months. Only my white fairy godcat was sitting between us with his eyes focused on me and his butt facing Oscar, which I was sure was on purpose. My familiars, Mr. Prince Charming and Madame Torres, were still harboring hard feelings over my marriage to my best friend Oscar Park. They were a little possessive of me. You too? I asked and let out a heavy sigh. He put a paw on my arm and I gave him a little scratch between his ears. White fur flew everywhere. He jerked away, turning toward Oscar. He jumped on Oscar's chest, using it as a springboard off the bed, and darted out the bedroom door. Ouch, Oscar groaned in a groggy voice and rubbed his chest before turning on his right side and beginning to snore lightly. The moonbeams dotted the walls of the bedroom through the window blinds, giving me just enough light to see my handsome new husband. His black hair blended into the dark room, but seeing his silhouette outlined by the moon made my insides bubble with happiness. Even after two months of marriage, I still wasn't used to the fact that I was finally Mrs. Oscar Park, though I kept my legal name of June Heal for business purposes. I sighed when seeing Oscar's slumber didn't ward off the soul freeze. I shivered. I glanced over to the closed blinds and wondered what kind of weather we were having. There was snow predicted, and maybe that was the cold that had settled deep in my bones. I loved how our village of Whispering Falls, Kentucky, looked when it was blanketed in snow. I loved how it added a little coziness to my little homeopathic cure shop, a charming cure. I like to think I helped people feel better in a natural kind of way. Um, maybe with a little help for my spiritual gift. I'm blessed beyond belief with the spiritual gift of intuition, which helps me create the perfect cure for the customers who walk into my shop looking for the right homeopathic cure for them. Some people might see me as a witch, a good one, mind you, but I like to refer to myself as a spiritualist. It just sounds better. I was from the good cider community of the witch world, meaning we only did magic for the good. Meow. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming stood at the bedroom door. I'm coming. I peeled back the covers and tiptoed out of the room. There was a lot to do at the shop, and a lot of generic potions to be made. Lying in bed awake wasn't going to help to get the shop ready for the town's second annual winter bazaar that was taking place in a couple of days. Oscar didn't have to go into work until later in the day, and he deserved to sleep in. He'd been pulling double duty as sheriff of Whispering Falls and a deputy of Locust Grove, the town over, which was not a magical town like Whispering Falls. Mr. Prince Charming's long tail happily danced in the air in front of me as I hurried down the hall to the combination kitchen and family room of my little cottage on the hill overlooking the village. I ran my hand along the orange couch on my way to push the button to my coffee maker. A good cup of hot, magical beans was what I needed to get the chill out of my soul. I looked out the window and smiled at the small flakes of snow. The wind rushed around with snow in its breath, blanketing the rooftops of all the small shops. The smell of freshly brewed coffee danced around my nose. I sucked in a deep breath, my eyes focused down the hill along the main street where the gaslight carriage lights flickered between the holes in the pine needle wreaths that were hung for decoration. Puffs of smoke curled into the air and danced in gray swirls in the moonlight. I followed the swirls to the ground and watched as a lantern swung back and forth from Eloise Sandalwood's grasp. She swung the chain to the right, and keeping in the same time, she swung it to the left, giving each shop a morning cleanse, just as she did every morning, by using her spiritual gift as an incense spiritualist. Her long green velvet cloak dragged behind her with each deliberate step. The edges of her bright red hair peeked out from the hood, shielding her from the brisk wind and blowing snow. 
Eloise was Oscar's aunt, and now mine, though I had loved her long before she became family. She happened to have been my mother Darla's best friend during the small amount of time my mother had lived here. Darla was not a spiritualist, and when my father had gotten killed in the line of duty, Darla and I moved to Locust Grove, where she tried to raise me as a mortal. Oscar also grew up in Locust Grove, across the street from us. I was in love with him since day one. Little did we realize we were destined to fall in love. Only he was a dark-sider spiritualist, which made it a little tricky for us to get married, but that was a whole other story. It was all well and good until Darla had died and the spiritualists had come looking for me, and Oscar. Neither of us had any idea about our pasts, nor of our powers. I watched Eloise cleanse the village with loving memories of how she was able to help me understand where I had come from and share more about my mother. Wow. Mr. Prince Charming stood on his hind legs and planted his paws on the window. I leaned over a little more, getting a look at what he was staring at. Eloise had stopped in front of Magical Moments, the flower shop, a little too long, longer than usual. She was facing my little cottage on the hill. Her emerald green eyes glowed, a red aura circled them. It was as if she weren't present. Her red lips moved at warp speed and the smoke from the incense burner puffed like a freight train. She gripped the chain in her hand, swinging the chain higher and higher, clinking louder and louder, echoing throughout the mountainous town. The coffee-maker buzzed, making me jump and turn away from the trance Eloise had put me in. I sucked in a deep breath and straightened my shoulders. Mr. Prince Charming jumped off the counter, and I watched him as he circled my ankles doing his signature figure-eight move. My eyes slid back up to the window and down the hill, but Eloise was gone. The backdrop of the mountains was filled with the purple dawn just beyond the horizon, leaving me with a sudden chill deep in my soul that had woken me from slumber. Chapter 2 "'Good morning,' I called out to Arabella Paxton, owner of Magical Moments, and a florist and spiritualist who can read people by the flowers they choose. I touched the ornamental gate that led up to Magical Moments. The iron stems of the gate turned green like the stems on flowers and blossoms of every color appeared all over the gate, creating its own little garden. A giggle escaped my lips. I'm never going to get used to that. I winked and pushed my way through, heading to the top of the steps where Arabella had just put her key into the door, leading inside magical moments. Every shop in Whispering Falls had an ornamental gate and front door that led you inside the magical shop. Every shop owner had a spiritual gift, and magical moments was a perfect cover for Arabella to use her gifts. Isn't it just lovely against this dreary day? Arabella turned to greet me, strands of her long black hair brushed against her olive complexion, sticking to her high cheekbones from the damp snowfall. Her crystal blue eyes deepened when she smiled. Seeing you so happy does make the dreariness go away. She motioned for me to follow her. Come on in. I have a new flower for the season to show you. The inside of Magical Moments was truly magical and made me a little envious. My shop, A Charming Cure, displayed my potions on the table and mounted wall displays, but Magical Moments was an altogether different experience. The sound of the babbling brook that ran through the center of the store gurgled and chirped. Colorful flowers grew along each side of the creek bed, along with greenery, making it full and lush. The tiered black display tables were filled with pre-made vases of arrangements emitting the most exotic smells. Over here. She pointed to the clawfoot table in the corner. The purple vase was a staple in the center of the fancy table, but the flowers always changed. I hurried alongside her and tucked a strand of my black hair behind my ear. I had let my hair grow out for my wedding and it was driving me nuts. I couldn't wait for my appointment with Chandra Shango from a cleansing spirit spa to get it cut later today. This is a flower that never needs water. Arabella's eyes twinkled. Her face brightened with pride. The flower was a rather bland one, and I wouldn't have chosen to purchase it if I was in magical moments as a customer. There were four dull white, almost wilted-looking petals jutting out from a brown center seed. They ended in sharp points. The stem was thorny and bright green. It's definitely strange, I said, and watched as she snapped the flower open and held it over her mouth. A little stream of water trickled out of the green stem and into her mouth. It's full of nutritious water. She smacked her lips together. Wow. My mouth dropped. I had never seen anything like it. Sure, Arabella could touch a flower and bring it back, or I could make a potion to help with the life of the flower, but this was a whole new level of magic. 
Right? she asked. Her lips came together. Her smile sent a sparkle to her eyes. Good, too. And what would be the purpose of this? I questioned, trying to tap into my intuition to see if I could use it in a homeopathic cure. Not sure yet, but I figured if I told you then your little mind would go to work and figure something out for someone. She winked and pulled a couple of them out from the vase. I'm going to make you a fabulous arrangement for your shop. Oh, I'd love it. What is the name of it? I asked. Blood Mercy, she said, and lifted one up in the air. She twirled the stem in between her fingers and observed it from all sides. It's a strange name for such a lovely flower. I smiled and pictured the perfect place for the flowers, right next to the register where my customers would ask about them. Say, suddenly I remembered why I'd stopped by in the first place. I followed her to the table where she kept her tools for the pruning and whatever else she needed to create beautiful arrangements for her clients. Is everything going okay? Splendid. Why? She plucked, snipped, and fixed the flowers in a gorgeous green vase with little bubble-like bumps all over it. The bland, blood-mercy flower really wasn't all that ugly once Arabella dressed it in an arrangement with other flowers. Nothing that makes you feel like you need extra protection or a bad omen feeling? I asked. My finger grazed over the snipped pieces as I tried to play off the question with unconcerned attitude. Um. She put the last piece of baby's breath in the arrangement and placed her hands palm down on the table. Her head tilted, her mouth cocked to the side as if she were thinking long and hard, or pulling something out from the back of her brain. Nope. She shook her head. Should I be? Her eyes narrowed. No. The word rushed out of my mouth. Oscar said there was an emergency village council meeting this afternoon, and I wondered if he knew anything about it. He didn't know, and since your father—I refer to Gerald Regula, village council member and the Gathering Grove tea shop owner, her father—he hasn't said a word. She cackled. He hasn't had energy to talk. Baby Orin is still keeping them up at night. I smiled, thinking about cute baby Orin. He was the son of Gerald and Petunia Shrubwood, not to mention the cutest baby in Whispering Falls. Well, the only baby in Whispering Falls, and all of us spoiled him rotten. Hmm. I tapped my finger to my temple. I just might have to see what I can come up with for him. Gerald or Orin? Arabella pushed the vase toward me. Both. My brows lifted and I carefully picked up the vase. I can't thank you enough. You are so welcome. She walked from behind the table and I followed her to the door, where she flipped the sign on her door to open. You already have a line. Both of us looked out the door. I tucked the vase in my elbow and opened Magical Moments' door. Gosh, I lost track of time. I scurried down the steps. Good morning, I called to the customers in the line as I made my way past them, under the wisteria vine, and up the steps to the front door of a charming cure. I put the vase on the ground and reached in my bag to retrieve the skeleton key to open my shop door. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming stood underneath the archway, where the purple wisteria vine was still just as lively as it was in the summer. Something dropped from his mouth. I bent down to pick it up. Between the pads of my finger and thumb was a small brass bell charm. Panic rioted deep within me as my intuition rang. Chapter 3 Really? My voice rushed underneath my breath as I spat towards Mr. Prince Charming. I juggled the vase of flowers and my mind, which was difficult, when I tried to flip the sign on the door to open and flipped on the switch of the cauldron sitting on the table next to the door. I rushed to the counter and put the vase down next to the register, where I knew it would look perfect. It did. I threw my bag on the chair and took a look around the shop. Customers were coming in and dispersing in all directions. Any minute Faith Mortimer from Wicked Good Bakery would be there to deliver my morning supply of hot apple cider from the Gathering Grove and the delicious June's gems from Wicked Good Bakery for my customers to enjoy while wandering through the shop. It was a great marketing tool to keep them looking there while getting a free snack to eat. June's gems were pretty addicting, and I loved it. Mr. Prince Charming darted to the back of the room and jumped on top of the counter next to the cash register, where he loved to sit and watch over the shop. His nose lifted to the flowers and he checked them out. "'Can't you for once let me have a moment's peace?' I asked him. I unhooked my cloak and swung it off my shoulders, hanging it on the coat tree next to the counter. Row! he hissed and jumped down. The red skirt on the round table closest to the counter brushed the floor as he swept under it to find a safe place from my anger. The customers were picking up bottles, opening them, smelling them, giving me time to take a closer look at the charm. It wasn't like the other silver charms Mr. Prince Charming had given me every other time I'd needed protection from something coming my way. 
This time the charm was brass. Definitely different. I tucked it away in the front pocket of my jeans. I ran my hand over my charm bracelet clasped around my wrist and recalled all the other times Mr. Prince Charming had showed up and dropped off a charm. The first time was on my tenth birthday. I'll never forget it. I had always wanted a cat and a charm bracelet. Darla would give me neither. She insisted that cats were dirty and charm bracelets were too expensive. I thought she'd given in when Mr. Prince Charming showed up on the front steps of our house in Locust Grove with a charm tied around his neck. It wasn't until years later when I had found out Mr. Prince Charming had been sent by the Order of the Elders and the Whispering Falls Village Council to keep me protected since I didn't live in the protection of the village. Somehow they had figured out that I did have the spiritual powers of my father and not the mortal side of Darla. Darla must have known something was up because she let me keep him. He turned out to be my fairy godcat, protecting me by giving me the charms. But somehow I always got dragged into crazy situations where people ended up dead. There was no time to worry about this now. I had a full day of work and potions to make. The Christmas bazaar was in a couple of days, and I hadn't even taken out the decorations from the attic of the shop, much less decorated the window display that the village council had requested already be done. There was just too much to do to worry about a little old charm, I told myself, to feel a little better. I took my hand from my charm bracelet and ran it across the framed photo from my wedding where Oscar and I were grinning ear to ear, Aunt Helena next to me and Eloise next to Oscar. It was all the family we had. I had the perfect spot I wanted to hang it in the shop, right on the wall next to the only other framed photo that was of my mom and dad. The only photo I had of them together. I grabbed the hammer from underneath the counter and a small tack. I centered the frame perfectly under my parents' photo. Careful not to smash my fingers, I slowly nailed the tack and hung the wedding photo. It was exactly the right spot. Yoo-hoo! June! The voice could be heard, but the person could not be seen. Excuse me! Excuse me! A little louder and a little louder and then finally, Excuse me! The customers parted and Constance Karima waddled past them and up to the counter. Her beady green eyes focused on me, her white hair set in tight curls around her head, her glasses pushed up on the bridge of her nose, and her blue house dress swooshed with each heavy step. I am fed up to here. Constance's hand flew up to her neck in a karate-chopping motion. I'm not kidding. I can see that. I bit my lips together, trying not to smile. My teeth clenched, pinching the skin together in more pain than I wanted. But the wrath of Constance would be worse. How can I help you? I told you a couple of months ago that my sister was nuts, one hundred percent crazy, and I know you got a little taste of it at your wedding. Her right eyelid lowered, her left brow cocked. She searched my face for a reaction. No. Slowly I shook my head, denying anything that I did see. It was between me and Patience Karima, Constance's twin sister, exact twin. I came to you before your wedding and asked you for your help. She jabbed the counter with her finger. Now I am demanding your help demanding. Shh. I came from behind the counter when I noticed she had gotten some of the customer's attention. This is not to be discussed here. This is a matter of the spiritual world. I leaned over and whispered into her ear. You and I both know that rule. Number one in the bylaws state that no other spiritualist can read the other unless given permission. I'm giving you permission. She drew her finger up to her chest. I have a funeral taking place next week and you have got to get down there today and fix her. She is talking to herself giggling out of her mind and playing with that stupid ostrich. She huffed a sigh and crossed her arms over her chest. If you don't fix her crazy, I'll never get this funeral together in a week. The twins owned the two sisters in a funeral. It was the only funeral home in Whispering Falls, and since we didn't have a lot of people dying, the village council allowed other surrounding counties to use the funeral home as well. And I must admit that it probably didn't look good if one of the funeral directors was acting a little cuckoo. You know that you can't do that, I said, and she opened her mouth to protest. I put my hand up to stop her. But— Her mouth snapped shut. If it makes you feel any better, I will go see her and talk to her. Well— She turned her chin to the side and then up in the air. It might make me feel a little better. I placed my hand on the side of her arm and gave her a little squeeze. Good. I nodded. I'll see if I can get Faith to come in after she does her deliveries and watch over the shop for a few minutes. I'm not guaranteeing anything. Even though Constance accepted what I had told her I would do, I could tell by her snapping eyes that she wasn't all that happy. I sucked in a deep breath. The smell of money floated around my head, up my nose and past my shoulders, over to an older man in the corner of the shop near the front window. If you'll excuse me, I have a customer who needs my help. 
I gave Constance one last pat before I walked around her and over to the gentleman. He stood about my height, five foot eight, had a thin build and wore a pair of brown khakis, brown loafers, a blue overcoat. His blond hair was short on the sides and spiked in the front with a little gel to look stylish. Good morning. I smiled and noticed he was looking at the stress-free lotions I had recently sold in the head-to-toe works store in a national deal. Ever since the product hit the shelves of the national chain, a charming cure's front door had almost become one of those revolving doors in those fancy hotels. That is gentle June's, and a little dabble do you. The product here in the store was much different than the one I had created for head-to-toe works. My homeopathic spiritual gift was much better in person. Take this guy. He was looking at the stress-free lotions, which obviously means he was stressed. About what? Family? Job? Fire? Who knew? But I did. The lingering smell of money around him, which his body was emitting, told me how he was stressed about money. When someone was stressed about money, it only made this situation worse. Given the age that he looked, I was under the assumption his money issues were probably related to retirement or not having enough for retirement. My job was to put a little extra something in the bottle to not let him stress so much, prioritize his life or his situation, and let the money begin to flow back into his world. I'd help him by adding a little extra to his bottle of stress-free lotion using my cauldron hidden behind the counter. That was how the magic in my shop worked. The head-to-toe works bottles worked differently. I was obviously not able to go to everyone's home who had purchased the product, so I had to put the magic in the bottle. When the customer touched the bottle, the bottle created the magic inside, combining with the lotion. It's very hard to understand, but that was how magic worked, at least in my world. I feel a little weird coming in here. The customer glanced around. I mean, it's all women, he whispered. So? Everyone gets stressed, and most men wouldn't recognize it. I snapped my finger and pointed at him. That is why you are going to have an advantage over all the men in your industry. I already do. His shoulders shrugged when he laughed. There are a lot of secrets in my industry. His emphasis on industry caused my gut to knot and my pulse quicken. He smiled, softening his face. I mean that in a good way. In that case, I plucked the lotion from his hands. I've got just what you need. I'll be right back. My mind reeled with what his job might be, but asking him would be plain nosy. I was the answer to his problem, otherwise he wouldn't be in my shop, and my intuition wouldn't have gone off. I could help him, but it was up to him to carry out the application of the potion. The other customers in the store were content and occupied with all the different cures around the shop, so I had time to start the guy's special lotion for his money troubles. My eyes slid down to the floor, where Mr. Prince Charming's tail was sticking out from underneath the table skirt. I walked behind the counter and grabbed my bag off the stool before disappearing behind the partition where my cauldron was hidden from the world. Behind me was a couple of shelves. One held different ingredients, things like bat eyelashes, fish scales, antimony tartrate, arsenic trioxide, and flecks of human skin. And the other shelf held many different sizes, shapes, and colors of potion bottles. I flipped the cauldron switch and proceeded to run my finger down the shelf of ingredients. With the customer in mind and the smell of money, the perfect ingredients would appear. Bushmaster snake? The bag with bits of snake glowed. Without question, I picked the cloth bag up and continued down the line. The Jua Occidentalis? I questioned when the bottle of wart remover glowed. Down the line I went and reached the last ingredient. Calendula officinalis? I gulped and picked it up, placing it next to the other two near the cauldron. None of these ingredients made sense to me. The Bushmaster snake was mostly used in a wide range of issues, so that wasn't so shocking. But the Thujua occidentalis and Calendula officinalis were alarming. Thujua occidentalis was mainly used in warts and chronic conditions, and Calendula officinalis was used in healing wounds. None of these were used for stressful money issues. I sucked in a deep breath and closed my eyes. The smell of money was even more fragrant as the air filled my lungs. There was no way my intuition was off. There was more to this man than I knew, but he was here for one thing and, according to my gift, he needed help with money. I shook off my doubt and grabbed the Bushmaster first. Carefully I pulled on the cloth bag's drawstrings and pinched a piece of the snake off, throwing it into the cauldron. The cauldron glowed a deep green and immediately began to bubble. I used the ladle next to the cauldron to stir, staying in tune with my intuition. 
Next I added in the Thujua Occidentalis and watched the potion smoke and turn amber in color. The smell of cotton candy flew from the pot and caused me to jerk my head. The sugary treat made my mouth water, even though I hadn't had any cotton candy since Darla had taken me and Oscar to a traveling carnival in Locust Grove when we were children. What on earth? I gulped. Something was off. June, where are you? I heard Faith Mortimer call from inside the shop. I peeked my head around the partition and saw Faith next to the door. She was filling the cauldron with the apple cider and strategically placing the order of June's gems on the three-tier plate. I glanced back at the cauldron and quickly stirred it. I ran my hands down my apron, tucked a strand of hair behind my ear, and went to greet Faith. Here you go. She smiled sweetly at one of the customers who came to get a sample of the cider. Do you like ding-dongs? The customer nodded. Then you have to have a June's gem. She handed the customer one of the chocolatey treats named after me. You will love it. My go-to stress relief wasn't my own concoction of ingredients. It was the delicious treat of the ding-dong. When Faith and her sister Raven moved to Whispering Falls to open Wicked Good Bakery, Raven made her own take on the ding-dong and named them after me, June's Gem. I grabbed one and shoved it in my mouth. Um, stressed? Faith pulled back. Her long blonde hair was pulled up in a high pony. Her onyx eyes watched me intently. A little. My eyes slid over to the gentleman. Something wasn't right with him, but it wasn't my job to fix all his problems, just the ones my intuition clued in on. But I'm sure it'll all be fine. I smiled. Thank you for bringing these by. Are you busy today? Oh, gosh, extremely. Raven has me running two trips to Locust Grove's Piggly Wiggly today. She pointed out the window to the car with the big plastic cupcake on top. The pink and light green Wicked Good Bakery logo was printed across the side panels of the car. If you get finished early, do you think you could come by here this afternoon and man the shop? I asked. Faith was the only one in our village who I trusted working in a charming cure. She'd done it so many times before, and I kept her on my payroll for these just-in-case times. Patience Karima was one of those just-in-case times. I'd be happy to, her mouth twisted, because I have yet to hear anything for the paper. She tapped her ears. Faith's spiritual gift was clear audience. She was able to hear things beyond the natural sense of hearing. She clearly heard words from other spirits, guides, or angels in some magical way. This made her perfect for the job as the Whispering Falls Gazette's editor, our local paper. Only the paper wasn't in paper form. It was through wind and only for spiritualists to hear. I wondered why we hadn't gotten the news today. Most days the Gazette was delivered to me as I walked down for work in the morning. She and her sister lived above the bakery in their own apartment. Yeah, she shook her head. Nothing. Isn't that strange? I asked and handed a cup of steamy apple cider to a customer who walked through the door. Please enjoy. I smiled and stepped to the side to let them pass. Maybe a little strange, but it's winter and Christmas, which really isn't our big holiday, so maybe things are quiet. She shrugged. I'd better get going. I'll be back this afternoon to help out. Thanks. I waved her off and looked around the shop. Satisfied that everyone was okay, I walked back to the counter and disappeared behind the partition. The potion was moving in a wave-like way. I took the cork top off the Thujua Occidentalis, adding a couple of dashes to the cauldron and a couple of sprinkles of the Calendula Officinalis. The potion swirled. The murky, viscous substance turned silver and smelled like money. Satisfied, I turned around and ran my finger down the bottle shelf until the brown, masculine bottle glowed tan. The bottles picked their owner, and even though my intuition had a little hiccup, everything was coming together for the client. I flipped the cauldron off and held the brown bottle over the cauldron, letting the potion pour into the container. I cleaned up the bottle and quickly wrote the instructions on a piece of paper. When I came from behind the partition, the man was standing near the counter looking at my wedding photo. "'Did you just recently get married?' he asked. "'How can you tell?' I wondered. "'Your hair looks the same.' He was very observant. "'Is that your mother?' "'Oh, no,' I pointed to Aunt Helena. "'That is my aunt, and this is my husband, Sheriff Oscar Park, and his Aunt Eloise.' "'Where are their husbands?' he asked. "'Good grief,' I joked. "'No man is going to marry them.' I rolled my eyes. They are set in their ways, if you know what I mean. Your husband is the sheriff? He drew back. The lines in the corner of his eyes deepened. He had to be older than he looked. Very cool. He's a good guy. I held the bottle out to him. He didn't take it immediately. He just stood in front of the photo and stared. I spoke. These are the instructions. You just use a dab on your lips like lip balm. It's amazing. You're gonna love it. Lip balm, huh? His eyes narrowed when he looked at me as though he were studying me. 
Just as easy as that. I handed him the bottle. Thank you very much. Our fingers touched, sending a shock of energy between us. A hazy warning breezed past me. He didn't seem to notice and took the bottle. I stayed a couple of steps behind him on his way out. I pulled back the curtain in the display window and peeked around it. The man jogged down the steps, the snow not hindering him at all. There was a smile on his face, and he nodded his head as other customers passed him on the way in. Abruptly he stopped when he nearly knocked over Petunia Shrubwood as she was heading toward her shop, Glory Bee Pet Shop. She and he exchanged glances, their eyes traded a string of confusion as if there was something between them. I watched as they brushed each other off and went on their separate ways. Chapter 4 By the end of the morning the bustling snow had given way to a lone, flying flake here and there, leaving a lovely thin blanket of snow on the sidewalks. The carriage lights had a thick layer on the steeple, and the wreaths Arabella had made to hang on each one had a dusting on their greenery. It was like I was back in Locust Grove, getting ready to celebrate the holidays. Everyone in Whispering Falls had been reluctant over the past couple of years to do the holiday bazaar, but the turnout was great, so hoping to boost the economy, the village council had decided to do it again. I didn't mind, because I loved celebrating all things Christmas, and dragging the boxes labeled Christmas decorations down from the attic really did put a spring in my step. I dragged the box with the Christmas tree and decorations to the front of the shop, where the window display would go, and headed back to the counter. I pulled Madame Torres out of my bag and looked around the shop one more time to make sure there were no customers around. Good afternoon, I tapped on the glass ball. I cannot believe you woke me up at the god-awful hour of four in the morning. Madame Torres was such an exaggerator. Her head appeared in the globe, her eyelids heavy with purple eyeshadow, her lips lined with red. She spoke. A girl of my age has to have her beauty sleep. And just how old are you? I maneuvered into uncharted territory. I had no idea how old she was. In fact, I'd never asked. Mystic Lights was the first shop I had gone into when I first came to Whispering Falls. I had gone to see Isadora Solstice about opening a shop here, after she'd found me in Locust Grove. When I walked into the light store, I had no idea I was a spiritualist, and I was about to be informed of my heritage. Madame Torres glowed every time I had gotten near her, and to my knowledge, or so I was told, crystal balls and their owners are destined only for each other, for life. Unfortunately, Madame Torres can be a little snarky at times, and I love to threaten her by telling her I'd take her to a flea market for someone to buy as a paperweight, because she and I both knew she wouldn't be able to show herself unless she belonged to me. "'You dare ask such a question?' Madame Torres turned her head, her red turban pinned tightly to her head, her red flaming hair poked out from underneath. "'I was going to say how fabulous you looked for your age,' I teased. "'What on earth is on your head?' Madame Torres questioned, her voice snarled. "'You don't like it?' I asked her, and smiled when a photo of me in a red Santa hat floated in her glittery globe. She glared. "'Merry Christmas!' I chirped in an annoying, happy voice, just to aggravate her even more. "'But seriously, can you give me a little festive music while I get the decorations up?' I was ready to get into the festive mood, even if I had to make myself forget the little brass bell charm. If I must. She disappeared from the globe and replaced herself with a light blue background and lightly falling snow. She looked like a snow globe. But don't think I'm happy about it. I hate the cold and I hate the mortal holidays. So, uh, friendly, she groaned before she played White Christmas. I opened another box and took out the pre-lit tree, standing it on its built-in base, the branches folded open and out. It was lunchtime, and the Gathering Grove and Wicked Good both had lines out the door from the tourists. It was a perfect time to get the tree up in the display window and work a little magic. The bell above the door dinged, letting me know someone had come in. I crawled out from under the tree where I was separating the last of the branches to find Oscar standing in the doorway with a cup of coffee. My hero. I blinked rapidly and clapped my hands together. You are adorable in that hat. You did always love Christmas when we were little kids. Oscar's smile grew as his hand extended toward me to hand me the coffee cup. I figured you were getting tired and could use a pick-me-up. You tossed and turned all night. I did? I asked him and gave him a kiss. You don't remember? He looked at me curiously, which I might have thought was odd, but his devilishly handsome looks in his sheriff's uniform outweighed any thoughts I might have had about anything. 
No. I shook my head and took a sip of the coffee. Hmm. The extra jolt of pumpkin spice calmed my soul. Perfect choice. I'm a little concerned about why you were so restless. He wasn't about to let it die, and I wasn't about to tell him about the sudden chill I'd had in bed. It would only upset him, and he'd stick close by my side. Not that I didn't love him right by my side, but I had things to do, like get the window display up and people to see, like Patience Karima. I'm fine, my voice rose an octave. See? I pointed over to Madame Torres. I even have festive music playing. I ran my hand down my jeans, feeling the charm I had completely forgotten about in my pocket. Wood. Oscar's eyes narrowed. What wood? I asked, placing both hands on the sides of the cup and turning to look at my tree. You looked funny. He took a step closer. I do have a Santa hat on, I teased. Seriously. Oscar wasn't buying my hat excuse. He was always good at reading me and my expressions, no matter how much I tried to conceal them. You have never had a good poker face, and if something is going on in that cute little head of yours, I need to know. I put my finger up to his lips to stop him. I've got to get this window display finished, and since everyone seems to be having lunch, it's perfect timing. I put the cup down on the table where the apple cider cauldron was located and picked up some garland out of another box so I could hang it around the window. Yeah, okay. Oscar wasn't buying it, but if I could get him out of the shop, I'd get down to Bella's Baubles to get this little matter of the bell charm addressed and find out what exactly it meant on my way to see patients. I looked out the window when I heard a car pull up across the street. It was Faith, pulling up the cupcake car in front of Wicked Good. If she came over here to work, Oscar would really be asking all sorts of questions. Maybe we should go ahead and take our honeymoon. Oscar grinned from ear to ear. His devilishly handsome good looks made my heart pound and toes curl. His blue eyes popped against his olive complexion, and his black hair had just enough gel in it to muss up the longer length on top and to slick the close-cropped sides. Honeymoon, I whispered, wondering just when we were going to get the time away from the hustle and bustle of our duties in Whispering Falls. You have that meeting. We have the bazaar. You know you can't take off in Locust Grove with all the extra work they have for you there. During the holidays, normal towns like Locust Grove always saw a rise in crime. They had put Oscar on the schedule more than usual to help patrol the shopping centers. Not like Whispering Falls. If someone tried to take something from any of our shops, our intuition would go off like the siren on top of the two sisters in a funeral's ambulance. I guess you're right. He reached out and pulled me close to him. His chin rested perfectly on top of my head. He whispered, but you promise that we will get away after all this stuff dies down. Promise. I curled up on my toes and granted him a slow and thoughtful kiss, something that would hold him over until we got home tonight. Then I'd better get going to the emergency village council meeting. His eyes didn't leave my face. Are you sure you're okay? I really tried not to smile or even give a hint that I was a tad bit worried or that something was not right. Satisfied, he said, I'll see you at home tonight. Right after my haircut, I reminded him of my appointment, after all the shops were closed and Chandra could fit me in. Keep the hat on. He winked and pulled me close. He wrapped me in his arms and gave me a kiss before he left. The cold air pushed in when he shut the door behind him. I jerked the hat off my head and tossed it aside. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out the charm, placing it in my palm. I rubbed it with my finger and watched Oscar run across the street to the police station. Meow. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming stared at me. He sat next to the Christmas tree. So, I shrugged and put the charm back in my pocket. The tree was one of those pre-lit, easy-peasy kinds. I plugged in the lights and was happy to see they all appeared to work. The memory of how I'd slip out the door and meet Oscar under his big oak tree to share a ding-dong while Darla was fussing each year with the big ball of knotted lights brought a smile to my face. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming swept his tail back and forth, dragging the floor. I stepped back to get a good look at the whole tree. Looking up, I noticed the branches were flattened and stuck together, so I lifted up on my tippy-toes and spread a couple of the tree branches near the top. I didn't have to tell him anything yet. Wow! Mr. Prince Charming stood up on his hind legs and batted at the dangling charm bracelet from my wrist. He and Oscar might have a love-hate relationship and might not get along all the time, but Mr. Prince Charming knew Oscar would keep me safe. I'll tell him after I go see Bella, I said. She was the one who helped me understand what each charm meant. 
Bella Van Lu owned Bella's Baubles, the only jewelry store in Whispering Falls. No doubt Mr. Prince Charming had gotten the charm from her. Every charm he'd ever given me had come from her. The bell above the door dinged. Mr. Prince Charming ran over and rubbed up against Faith Mortimer's leg. "'My goodness, it's getting cold out there!' Faith rushed in. Frigid air chased in behind her. She slammed the door. "'And the wind isn't talking to me.' She bent down and picked up my furry cat. His purr grew louder with each swipe of her hand down his back. I gnawed on the corner of my lip. My eyes lowered, and I rubbed my hand down the front pocket of my jeans. I looked out the window and over the shops. The afternoon sky looked gray. Dark clouds formed over the tips of the mountainous background. A nervous feeling curled inside my stomach. My intuition told me something was brewing, something that was not welcome in Whispering Falls. The cackle of customers and happy faces skewed my view as they walked by on the sidewalk in front of the shop. "'Looks like we're going to have some customers,' Faith interrupted my thoughts and set Mr. Prince Charming back on the ground. "'You can run on and do your errands.' Faith was more than capable of holding down the fort while I hurried down to see Bella and make good on my promise to see Patience. I'm ready to take over. I won't be long, I assured her, and hurried back to the coat tree to grab my cloak. I grabbed the edges and snapped it out in front of me before I wrapped it around me and tied the straps around my neck. I grabbed Madame Torres in my bag, stowing her deep at the bottom. "'Can I drop the holiday cheer?' I heard Madame Torres snap from the bottom of the bag. Without looking in my bag, I gave the ball a quick smack with the pads of two fingers, shutting her up. The music turned off. "'If you need something, just holler. I'll be in the village.' I didn't exactly want to tell her what I was up to. Faith might accidentally let it slip if I did tell her I had a new protection charm. It was a risk I didn't want to take. Oscar had enough on his plate, and I was sure I could figure this out on my own. I put the strap of my bag across my body while making my way through the customers, looking at all the homeopathic bottles. I opened the door and stepped out, grabbing the edges of the cloak and wrapping it tighter around me to ward off the nippy, chilling air. Only I realized the chill was still from deep within my soul. Chapter 5 Hmm. Bella Van Lu was hunched over the glass counter at Bella's baubles, looking at the brass spell charm through the loop. He definitely picked a different charm this time. Bella shivered from her toes to her hair follicles. So much so the bracelets around her wrists jingled. What was that? I eyed her suspiciously. What? She flipped her head to the side, letting her long blonde hair fling over her shoulder. That shiver. I pointed my finger at her, outlining her body. Chilly. She crossed her arms, rubbing her hands up and down her arms. She gave a slight smile that didn't show the gap between her teeth, nor was the smile the kind that balled her cheeks. This kind of smile I didn't need my intuition to tell me that she was hiding something. Chilly? Really? I leaned forward and planted my hands on the glass counter and bent down a bit, since Bella was five foot two, bringing myself nose to nose with my friend. After all we've been through, you're going to tell me you're chilly? Bella took a step back. Her smoky eyes showed a slight, watchful hesitation. Her throat moved up and down. Her mouth parted. She put her tongue between the gap in her two front teeth, like she did when she was nervous. You are doing that thing with your tongue, I pointed to her mouth. What thing? She pinched her lips together. That tongue thing between your teeth. I twirled my finger in front of her mouth. That thing you do when you're nervous. I planted my hands on my hips. If you know something, just tell me. <clears throat> she cleared her throat. This is one charm I wish he hadn't picked out. She sniffed through her nose. A creepy uneasiness found its way in the bottom of my heart. I sucked in a deep breath. I had to face it. I was a witch. How bad could it be? I'm ready. I straightened back up and pulled my shoulders back. My cloak fell behind my shoulders and hung on my back. The tie made me feel like I was choking, but I wasn't about to adjust it. I needed to be strong. The bell is a symbol for letting you know something is coming, or has come, like the bell over doors. It lets you know someone is there. But the brass is another story. She used her finger to push the small brass bell charm on the glass counter toward me. Brass helps protect from falling for the evil eye, from evil spirits and any sort of spell cast against you. Spell cast against me? I giggled at the thought, knowing that was virtually impossible, since casting spells was against the bylaws. Have you made anyone mad lately? 
Bella asked as if she were giving me a hazy warning. The look on her face told me she wasn't kidding. Mad? My head jerked side to side. Who on earth could be mad at me? Well, your wedding was less than what was promised, she shrugged. My wedding? I drew my hand up to my chest. It was amazing. Okay, maybe it wasn't what Oscar and I had planned. The town was crazy excited about the union between Oscar and I. It was a match the spiritual gods had to create, since Oscar was a darksider spiritualist and I was a goodsider spiritualist. Darksiders were known to have a bit of an evil side, but there were good ones like Oscar and Eloise Sandalwood. Even Faith's sister was a darksider. Long story short, her parents had a multi-spiritualist union like Oscar and me. And if Oscar and I had children, one of them could— Oh my God, I gasped. What if it's Aunt Helena? Your own aunt would put a spell on you? Bella asked in a really no way. What are you talking about? Are you crazy, Tone? It might seem far-fetched, but look at what happened when I met Raven and Faith when I was a student at Hidden Halls at Spiritualist University. My brows rose. They come from a multi-spiritualist family, and Aunt Helena had a problem with it. They were causing havoc at the university. Bella didn't see what I was saying. Even though they were trying to keep the other safe. It was true. It had been set up to look like Raven had almost killed Faith when Faith was poisoned, but really it was a different evil force. Helena didn't do it. Bella reminded me how my own aunt wasn't a killer. I'm not saying she's a killer. Maybe she put a little hex on me to not get pregnant. A deep sigh escaped me, lifting my shoulders up and then down. Pregnant? Bella looked a little frazzled. How did we go from multi-spiritualist relationships to pregnancy? Think about it. I knew it was off, maybe way off. Aunt Helena was so mad about me not having the ancestral dance performed at midnight, and because Oscar isn't a good cider, I wasn't about to do it. I ran my hands through my hair, and we all know how the wedding plans had changed. Even though Aunt Helena didn't say it, or act like it, I could tell she wasn't happy when I went to my bridal shower the night before the wedding, and through a strange turn of events, Oscar and I got married that night, at an impromptu ceremony. It ended up being perfect for us, but not the wedding my only living relative wanted me to have. You've got to be kidding. Bella reached across the counter, grabbed my wrist, and clipped my charm bracelet off of me. There is no way. I'm just saying she doesn't want me to have children yet, especially one that could be part darksider, or full. The thought of Aunt Helena possibly doing something like this was ridiculous. She would never put a spell or hex on me. But who would? You're right. She does love Oscar. Just not his heritage. And she did look like she was having a good time after we tied the knot. The fond memories of my wedding night still didn't override the feeling that something was not right. But what about that? I gestured to the charm she was putting on my ever-growing protection bracelet. I don't know. But I do know that he— I followed Bella's finger past my shoulder and out her front window, where Mr. Prince Charming was sitting on the outside window sill. He knows what is best. And this, she dangled the bracelet in the air, this is obviously what you need to keep you safe at this moment. Chapter 6 Well, well. I looked at Mr. Prince Charming, who was patiently waiting for me on the steps outside of Bella's baubles. I shook my wrist back and forth, letting the charms jingle against each other. Happy? Sarcasm dripped out of my mouth. I'd have been much happier if he hadn't dropped the charm by my foot. I told you it's a bad idea. Gerald Regula's voice echoed across the street from the front of the Gathering Grove tea shop. His back was to me, but Petunia Shrubwood faced him. This is not our holiday. But I think it will be good for the tourists who do come for the bazaar, Petunia insisted in a loud voice. Gerald shook his head and turned his body towards the street. Baby Orin was strapped to him in one of those front backpack-looking things new moms use to keep their babies snug tight to them. They come to the bazaar for our shops, to help our economy, not some— Gerald threw his arms in the air. Some carnival rides in the cold. His lips flapped together in a fluster. It's just another added bonus for them to stay in town. Petunia stomped her foot. Her usually messy brown hair was much messier today. A few holly berries dropped out of her hair. A couple of birds came out of nowhere, swooping down, and plucked them in their mouths. I tried to hear more of their conversation, but I couldn't make it all out. All I knew was that Petunia wanted to bring a carnival to the bazaar, and Gerald didn't. They were definitely arguing. 
Keep your voice down, Petunia whispered, her eyes gazed toward me, and then she leaned into Gerald. June is right there. Gerald glanced across the street. My hand shot up in the air. There was no way I could ignore them. It was a small village, and if I ignored them, they'd know I heard them. Hi! I waved. I darted across the street, avoiding a couple of cars driving down Main Street. Mr. Prince Charming made it over to them before I did. Look at sweet baby Orin. Isn't that adorable? I ran my finger over the top of the small baby black top hat that matched the one on Gerald perfectly. Thank you. Petunia had pulled Orin's baby blanket up clear to his eyes. Can I see his sweet face? I asked and smiled. No. Petunia shook her head. Her hair was falling down from the usual top knot. Half of her hair was up and half was down, not on purpose. It just looked like she had gotten out of bed and walked down the street, keeping the chill off of him. Yes, Gerald barked underneath his mustache, chill off of him. Gerald and Petunia's glances interchanged again. Petunia continued to tuck the blanket even tighter around Orin. She acted like an anxious child who had stumbled upon something she shouldn't have, or maybe I had stumbled upon something or a conversation they didn't want me to hear. Oh. I gestured my finger up and down Gerald's typical outfit of black suit with gray pinstripes and tux tails. You should get Orin a little outfit like yours, I winked, trying to break the ice. Only a haunting suspicion told me they didn't want to hear my chit-chat. Is everything okay? I asked, noticing the dark circles under Petunia's eyes. Baby Orin had really rocked their little spiritual world. They were used to caring for each other, and Petunia was used to caring for the four-legged creatures of the community. It's fine. Petunia's chin nodded up and down fast. All fine. She grabbed Gerald by the elbow and jerked it toward her. We have a village council meeting this afternoon. We must go or we will be late. Oh, yeah. I had forgotten all about the meeting. Oscar will be there. Do you want me to babysit Orin? That would be great. Gerald puffed up. Petunia jerked her hand from the crook of his elbow and smacked his arm. No, she cannot. But June loves Orin. She might be able to help, he muttered under his breath, and turned his head away from me as though I couldn't hear him. I can help. I rocked back and forth on my heels. My intuition was nagging me, but I buried the feelings deep in my toes. I could see there was something wrong. I didn't know what, but something was happening between them, and if I could take baby Orin while they went to the meeting, then I would. Petunia crossed her arms and jammed her hands under her armpits. Gerald unhooked the straps of the baby carrier and handed it to me with Orin tucked inside. Before I could protest, Gerald had that thing strapped across my body and snapped in the back. Baby Orin hung on me like a kangaroo joey. I tugged on my bag underneath Orin and moved it around my body, letting it rest on my back. Ah! I peeled back the cover to get a look at the sweet sleeping baby and nearly fell over. Oh! My voice fell flat. See? Petunia reached toward the snuggly bundle. Gerald smacked her hands away. She will tell the world. What happened? I asked, when I noticed Orin had a full man's mustache. Now, I hadn't been a spiritualist long enough to see any of the villagers have children, but I did know that babies weren't supposed to have full mustaches. I mean, he's cute, but what happened? My lip curled, and I leaned my head to the right to get a better look. Mr. Prince Charming jumped up on his hind legs and put his front paws on my thigh to get a better look. And him. Petunia buried her head in her hands. We don't know what happened. Gerald's chest heaved up and down. He woke up that way a couple of days ago. We went to the doctor in the middle of the night, but he knew nothing. I didn't even know where parents went to see a pediatrician, especially a spiritualist pediatrician. It was going to be a long time before Oscar and I even talked about having a baby. But we love him. Petunia stepped up between me and Gerald, her eyes filled with tears. I know you do. I put a flat palm on Orin's back and my other hand rubbed up and down Petunia. You have people here who love you and want to help out. If the doctor can't help us, who can? Petunia cried. And look at me. She used both hands to push her hair back up in the messy updo I was used to seeing her in. She used one of the twigs like a Chinese chopstick to keep it up. A bird popped its head out from underneath the massive head of hair and dove right back in. A feather floated down next to Petunia. Gerald grabbed it out of the air and held it toward me. Orin loves his face to be brushed with feathers. He pushed it in my face. I took it from him and stuck it down in my bag. What did the doctor say? I asked. I told you. He said he didn't know. Gerald's voice muffled and quieted as people walked by. Constance Karima was one of them. Her eyes met mine. Hers lowered. Mine popped open. 
Then she gave me a suspicious sideway glance, as if telling me she wasn't happy I hadn't stopped by to see patients. Really, with Constance away at the village council meeting, it would be much better. I really didn't have a clue what was going on with patients. Did Oren have tests run, or— I shook my head, trying to grab for any sort of ideas that came to me, but I had nothing. I knew nothing about babies. Oren is not a mortal baby, Gerald's voice lifted. Petunia kept her hands on her face. They just don't do tests like they do where you grew up. Oh. I decided to keep my questions to myself. They were on edge, and they obviously didn't want my opinion, which really meant nothing since I had no experience raising any kind of baby. Still, I did plan on trying to help them any way I could. We have to go. Are you sure you don't mind watching him? Gerald asked. I'm positive. I love this little guy. I looked down at Oren sleeping soundly. He was still just as cute with the man mustache. Cuter. Both parents gave me a concerned look. I'm fine. I put one hand on each of them and pushed them away from me and Oren. Go. You're going to be late. I don't even want to go, Gerald scoffed and rolled his eyes. I bet June would like a little winter carnival. Petunia sounded confident on what I might like. Right, June? I believe you were mortal once. They love a carnival. I did. I smiled, trying to keep the peace. It was hard to dampen down the memory of the sweet, delicious tastes of funnel cakes and gooey, fattening elephant ears. See? And most of our tourists are women. All are mortals. Petunia had a good point. I nodded. What exactly is going on? I had bits and pieces put together, but not the whole picture. Petunia called an emergency council meeting to get a sudden change in the bizarre plans approved. Gerald looked at his wife and then back to me. I think it would bring more people to the bazaar as well as keep them here longer, which turns into more money for the village economy," Petunia shrugged. That is what this emergency meeting is about? I questioned, finding it odd they would need to meet on such a decision. Yes, Gerald's brows lifted. I guess we'd better get going before we are late. Gerald rubbed baby Oren's back. It wouldn't be good if the village president was late. Gerald put an arm around Petunia. To anyone else it would look as though he was keeping her warm from the cold air, but I knew he was comforting her about two things. First was her worry about baby Oren staying with me, and second was the fact she was worried about why he had grown a mustache. I snugged Oren tight to my body, and even covered him more with the edges of my cloak as I watched Gerald and Petunia cross the street and disappear between a charming cure and magical moments on their way to the gathering rock. The gathering rock was behind a charming cure, up the hill, between the shop and my cottage. There was a big rock and a cleared area where all the village meetings and gatherings were performed. Normally I was asked to give a cleansing using my special sage sticks, but not this time. If it was just a vote about a silly carnival, there was no need to cleanse. Maybe subconsciously I knew that's why they hadn't asked me, so my intuition wasn't going off, but my insecure meter was. Who knew? All I did know was that Mr. Prince Charming had given me a brass bell charm to ward off evil, and baby Oren looked like an old man. Chapter 7 Two Sisters and a Funeral was located on the edge of town. It was a two-story Victorian red-brick house, typical of mortal funeral homes. It was the only building that didn't look like the rest of Whispering Falls, nor did it have a fun gate with a walkway. It was a typical southern-looking funeral home. The large Victorian home with big glass windows and a large covered gathering porch on the front. The inside of Two Sisters had the same look. Heavy and thick dark crown molding framed the walls along with thick threaded wall-to-wall -wall carpet. The entrances of the rooms were large and also outlined in the heavy dark crown molding. I had never been to a full funeral service at Two Sisters, but from what I had heard, Constance and Patience had a way of making the service feel more like a celebration of life instead of death. Everyone walked away from a Two Sisters and a Funeral Services, saying they felt their loved one was there and it was a little, well, magical. Come on, I said in a hushed whisper to Mr. Prince Charming. There was no way I was going to go in there alone. There was just something about going in a place where dead bodies were hanging out not to mention ghosts. Constance and Patience Karima's spiritual gift was helping the dead get to the other side. I was sure that was how families felt like they were celebrating their loved one's life instead of the end. I said to come on. Mr. Prince Charming was standing on the bottom step of the funeral home and not budging. 
I lifted my hand in the air and wiggled my wrist. The bracelet jingled. "'You got me into this. Come on!' I demanded through gritted teeth. "'I'm not going in there without my fairy godcat.' My brows lifted. "'Got it?' I opened the door and Mr. Prince Charming reluctantly ran in ahead of me. I stepped into the long, wide and dark hallway. The walls were draped in long, deep red fabric that hung from ceiling to floor. I couldn't imagine dusting those things. The pale yellow carpet with small red diamond designs lined the floors. Four large, heavy ornamental wooden doors, two on each side, were shut. The massive staircase at the end opened up to a wraparound balcony. "'Get back here!' Patience screamed, but she was nowhere to be seen. Thunderous footsteps boomed overhead. I looked up. Patience's pet ostrich jolted across the balcony above, his neck swooping forward with each step, and loose feathers flew behind him. Stop! Patience wobbled after him a few seconds later. She stopped in mid-wobble, one foot planted firmly on the carpet while the other was stuck in mid-air behind her. Her head slowly turned toward me and looked down. She clipped her mouth together and planted the other foot. She pushed her glasses up on her nose. She squeezed her little beady eyes at me and huffed. The hot air came out of her nose and fogged up her glasses. "'What are you doing here? Constance isn't here.' Her arms hung down her sides and she picked at the edges of her orange house dress. "'What the hell is that?' she pointed to Baby Orin. "'It's Baby Orin. I twisted my body so she could see. Her face contorted. With a hat. I said it like it was normal to put a top hat on a baby. And he has a mustache. I shrugged. Guess what's coming to the village for the bazaar? I knew Patience would be the first of us spiritualists in line at the carnival. She loved to have fun in a childlike kind of way, even though she was elderly. Out of nowhere, a small yellow ball bounced down the stairs and landed right next to Mr. Prince Charming. Wow! Mr. Prince Charming jumped, twisted in the air, batted the ball, and hid behind my legs. That! I pointed to the ball. That! I, um, I Patience hurried as much as she could hurry, pumping her arms as she bolted down the hallway. I darted up the stairs with Mr. Prince Charming right behind me. "'Oh, no, you don't!' I screamed, darting down the hall after her. "'If you want me to take you to the carnival, you have to answer some questions about this ghost boy.' The door at the end of the hallway closed. Immediately I went to that door and opened it, even though the feathers had stopped at a different door. When the door was fully opened, the shock of what was inside nearly knocked me over. A room full of caskets lined up one after the other, color after shiny color, made me dizzy. I put my hand on the doorknob and yanked the door back to me. I turned and planted my back against the door. What stood on the other side of that door gave me the full-on heebie-jeebies. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming taunted me from the hallway. I swear he had a smile on his face as if he was saying, I told you not to come in this funeral home. Why? I asked, why do you have to have fairy god anythings that are so unhelpful? Madame Torres and Mr. Prince Charming loved giving me a hard time. I doubt anyone else had that problem. Oscar carried a wand in his gun holster, and I never saw him even have to use it but once. It never gave him a bit of trouble that time. He pulled it out, pointed it, and it worked. No fuss, no backtalk, no nothing. Mr. Prince Charming must have felt bad, because he walked in and out between my ankles doing his signature figure-eight move that told me he was going into the casket room and was going to be okay. I closed my eyes, sucked in a deep breath through my nose, and ignored the smell of death that shot into my lungs, and let out a long, steady stream of air through my mouth. I closed my eyes, turned the doorknob, and flung the door open. Patience, I'm not playing. I planted my feet firmly on the ground and put my hands on baby Orin. He was getting fidgety. I was sure my heart rate had woken him up from his deep sleep, or at least caused him to stir. I won't take you to the carnival. I can't wait to bite into a crispy, juicy caramel apple. They are so juicy I have to wipe my chin so many times from the dripping goodness. All the caskets were sitting on top of the church carts, gurneys, but the one rattling caught my eye. With my eyes trained on the chattering death box, I slowly made my way over to it and knocked on top of the silvery steel casket. "'Go away!' Patience screamed from inside. "'Okay, so your sister came to me and said you were going nuts.' I put my mouth closer to the closed casket. It was time to come clean. "'I don't think you are nuts. I think you have more going on with your spiritual gift than you care to tell anyone.' I backed up when I saw the top begin to open. I think you've always had Constance to rely on and you've never had your own spiritual experience," I said. It was true. 
Every personal experience I had ever had with the twins was always the result of something Constance had said or done. Patience just stood behind her agreeing with everything she had said. The top fully opened and Patience lay in the cream silk-lined casket with her hands neatly crossed over her torso, like she was the owner of the deathbed. "'You might be right,' she squeaked out. "'I know I'm right,' I said and pointed to my gut. I know I'm not supposed to read other spiritualists, but you are blinking like one of them Las Vegas casino signs. Not only to me, but also to Constance. She knows something is going on and she wants me to fix you." Patience sat up. She used her fingers to fluff out her tight-knit curls on the back of her head that had been flattened while hiding in the casket. "'I don't know what to do,' she wrung her hands. "'You have to let me help you.' I put my hands out to help her out of the casket. "'No!' she smacked my hands away. I can get out of here without your help. I'm talking about the you-know-what. I can help you with both. I grabbed her hands and helped her out of the casket. I can certainly help you with your little ghost problem. He won't go away, no matter how much I ignore him. Her eyes darted to the door and the yellow ball bounced in. A little giggle escaped her and she kicked the ball back to the door. You encourage him. I looked back at the door and didn't see anything but the ball. I wasn't privy to seeing ghosts, and that was fine with me. I think that would be almost as bad as being a funeral home director like the Karimas. You can't laugh at him and expect him to leave you alone. Besides, aren't you supposed to help him get to the other side? He won't go. She hung her head down and shuffled her toe on the carpet. I don't even know where he came from. Her answer had hammered me. What? I asked. How can you tap into your gift and not help him? I don't know. She shook her head. I've always done it with Constance, but she doesn't see him." The him she was referring to was a little boy. He loved playing with the yellow ball and messing with the other spiritualists. In fact, he almost ruined my wedding. It was not a secret that Aunt Helena and Eloise didn't see eye to eye on the type of wedding Oscar and I should have, since both of them were the only living relatives we had. Both wanted to preserve our heritage and hadn't been willing to budge on the rituals. The little ghost boy loved to hang around Mr. Prince Charming, but my ornery cat clearly didn't like the little boy. I had no idea this little boy was around. I had mentioned out loud to Mr. Prince Charming how I wished I could have the wedding I wanted for my heritage, and the little ghost boy heard me, poisoning Eloise. Not enough to kill her, but enough to make her sick on the eve of my wedding during my bridal shower. I ended up putting two and two together and figured out the yellow ball belonged to a ghost. Not to mention I had caught Patience talking to the ball. Then I knew she saw him. Luckily I was able to give Eloise a potion to undo the poison. The only good thing that did come out of the whole poisoning thing, Aunt Helena and Eloise saw that my union with Oscar was far more important than some little ritual. This is a problem, I said, referring to Constance not seeing the little boy. He is awful. Her nose curled. He plucked the ostrich's feathers. He taunts him and even tries to poke him in the eyes. He only does it when Constance is around. That is why she thinks you've gone crazy. The ball rolled back toward us and stopped at my feet. I ran my hands over baby Oren when he moved. Oren lifted his little head, opened his eyes, and a big smile made his little man mustache curl. You shouldn't have brought Oren with you. Patience's eyes shot open. Her head slowly moved side to side. He likes babies. Her tone sent chills up my spine. Okay. I wanted to give her some sort of hope. I will help you get him to the other side. I don't know how, but I will. All I'm asking you do is not pay any attention to him when Constance is here. If you need a place to hang out, come see me. There was only one place I knew to look. The Magical Cures book. The grimoire Darla had left me. Chapter 8 Baby Oren was getting a little restless. I assured Patience I would get back to her once I found something to help her get the little ghost boy where he needed to go. I tucked the edges of my cloak around Oren's snuggie and held my hand close to his head. Trying to jingle my bracelet to keep him occupied and bounce while I walked down the street was a difficult task, only assuring me that children were far off from me and Oscar. My efforts were proving to be fruitless. June, wait! Raven Mortimer was standing underneath the awning on the sidewalk in front of Wicked Good Bakery. Her long black hair was draped over her right shoulder. Her black embroidered Wicked Good Bakery apron was nearly white from all the flour splashed all over it. She held a silver pan in her hands. "'I can't stop,' I called halfway across the street toward a charming cure. "'I've got Oren and he's fit to be tied. But I have something to tell you.' 
She had a bland ball of dough in her fist, not uncommon for her to have in her hands. I know, I know. I lifted my hand in the air and wiggled my bracelet back and forth. But I need to talk to you now, she insisted. The dough squeezed through her fingers. I stopped at the urgency of her voice and looked back at her. Oren let out another scream, sending my feet in a forward motion. Not now! I waved her off and headed to the gate. It's going to be okay, I said in my best baby voice and put my hand on the gate to a charming cure. The most god-awful, blood-curdling scream came out from under the man mustache. It made me detour around the shop and up the hill. Oren was not happy when he noticed I was not his mother or father. It's okay. We're going to go see your mama, I assured the little guy. Petunia was addressing Izzy, Gerald, Oscar, and Chandra, and a few other people I didn't recognize. Oren had calmed down the squeal to a gurgle, so I decided to stand in the back. Petunia and I made eye contact. I smiled to let her know everything was okay, even though it wasn't, and I couldn't wait to get him unstrapped from me. I'm not sure this is a good idea. A man stood up from the crowd of people with his back to me. It's not the ride's kind of carnival. We will walk through the streets with some juggling, balloon tricks, sword swallowing. You know, the man's shoulders shrugged, light magic. Light magic? Oh, the sound of that made my ears perk. We had never had other spiritualists join in on our bazaar. No wonder they needed to vote. But— I gulped. Why hadn't they asked me to cleanse? I took a deep breath when my intuition started to go off. The smell of money curled around my body, down my nose, and made me squeak. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't take my eyes off the man. The man stood about five foot eight, thinly built, and had on a blue overcoat. It was a coat I had just seen this morning. The man's words stopped when he turned around to address the crowd, and our eyes met. You! I gasped when I pinned him as the customer I had made a potion for earlier this morning at a charming cure. His face clouded with uneasiness. A warning voice whispered in my head, causing me to become dizzy. When I became dizzy, I knew what followed. Passing out, I sucked in a few quick breaths. Not now, I repeated, and made circles on Baby Oren's back with the palm of my hand. Not with Baby Oren strapped to you. I talked myself out of my dizzy spell. Or it could have been the crazy mixture of a rapid heart rate and the bitter cold taking over my body. Like a lightning rod, the man bolted from the gathering rock circle and disappeared into the wooded area. Wait! I screamed and snugged Baby Oren close to me. I ran after him as best I could without jiggling the baby around too much. You! You wait! I screamed, waving my arm in the air. He was obviously a spiritualist from somewhere, and he knew that when he came into my shop. If anyone found out that I had made him a special potion, I'd be in a lot of trouble. The trees on the edge of the woods parted on my arrival. I stopped, turned around, and noticed Petunia, Gerald, and Oscar were running after me. As if frozen in time, the Whispering Falls Gazette came through with the bitter breeze. Hear ye, hear ye, the winds have spoken, the chill hangs in the air. Hopefully the winter bazaar will be a great success for the village once again. We welcome the spiritual carnival. This update is brought to you by Glory B. Pet Shop and village president Petunia Shrubwood, who brought this wonderful carnival to town. Faith's voice faded off when the snap of branches cracked in the distance. Him! My eyes darted between the depths of the woods and the thunderous footsteps behind me. "'June, wait!' Oscar yelled from behind me. There was a tense shrill to his voice. I did the exact opposite. I ran towards the sounds of the breaking branches deep within the woods. The towering trees began to shed what leaves they had left, and they rained down on me. The owl hooted. The sky turned gray. Suddenly I felt suffocated, as if the branches were curling around me. I stopped. The air was thin, my chest heaved up and down. It felt as if I was struggling against something, struggling to breathe, struggling to move, struggling— "'June, what have you done?' Oscar scrambled over to me. His eyes drew down to my feet, causing me to look. "'I—I—' The words were struggling to come out of my mouth. The man was lying on the ground next to my feet, my potion bottle in his grip. "'Fresh body,' Constance Karima's voice escalated. She lifted her nose in the air and took a few quick inhales through her nose. Eagerly she rubbed her hands together. Excitement exuded from her. Her aura even glowed. I must get patience in the ambulance. I glared at her as she scurried off in the direction of Whispering Falls. Give me him. My body jerked as Petunia grabbed the snuggly pack from my body. Oscar's eyes met mine. My body stiffened with shock. June Heel 
Three little bodies floated down from the tops of the trees and hovered over the man's body, all three of them cross-legged, arms folded, and six eyes staring at me. I gulped. Hearing the order of elders say my name made my stomach hurt. They only showed up when something was wrong. Clearly, something had gone very wrong. Yes. My voice died away. I looked between all three Marys. Mary Ellen, Mary Lynn, and Mary Sue made up the trio. At the same time, their legs uncurled. Gracefully, they floated to the ground, landing on their black, pointy-heeled boots. He's dead. The chill hung on Mary Ellen's words. You are hereby confined to Whispering Falls, pending the investigation of the death of this man. Her voice cracked. She cocked her leg to the side and slowly drew her arms down her skin-tight black unitard and past her toes. She planted her finger on the guy's neck before jerking back up to standing. Her dark lashes cast a shadow on her face as she drew them open and focused on me. Her eyes slightly closed, her lips pursed. The lingering eyes of Chandra, Izzy, Gerald, Constance, and Oscar stared at the man while Petunia cradled baby Orin, singing in his ear. Chapter 9 I didn't do it! I paced back and forth in front of Oscar's desk in the police station. June, please sit. Oscar pointed to the chair. I can't sit. If Oscar or anyone else there staring at me thought I was just going to sit there and let it look like I had killed that man, they were nuts. I didn't do it. It sure looks like you did. Chandra's eyes narrowed. I mean, your bottle was in his hand, a bottle that you put your special gift in. Everyone knew that my intuition potion bottles were different than the bottles the basic homeopathic cures are in. And how did he get your bottle without coming into your shop? The special potion bottle? Izzy tapped her chin with her long, skinny finger. She swooped around, her A-line polka-dot orange and black dress twirled, and came face to face with me. Her long, blonde hair swept behind her shoulders. June, she gasped, you didn't make him a special potion. I gulped. Answer the question, June, the Marys said in unison, Mary Sue's voice more brash than the others. He came into the shop and he was looking around at my stress potions. When I walked closer, I smelled money. Money? Petunia asked. Everyone looked at her and she clamped her mouth shut. When the Order of Elders speak, you are supposed to remain silent. Yes, money, I confirmed. I didn't mean to read him. My intuition took over and it did. If I'd known he was some sort of spiritualist in town, then I wouldn't have read him. Not only does this look like you murdered him by the evidence, but you also broke the first bylaw. Mary Lynn stood four feet tall. She rubbed the fox stole around her shoulders with long, deliberate strokes. How was I supposed to know? Did you read your intuition? Mary Ellen strutted around the police station in her unitard. She coiled a strand of her long black hair around her finger. Did you get chills? A pit in your stomach? She pointed to her gut. Chills? Pit? Did I? I've been having chills since I woke up. I grabbed my wrist and ran my finger over the brass bell charm. What? Oscar asked, concern in his voice. He was good at reading me. His eyes drew down to my hand. Did you get another charm? My eyes grew as my chin slowly lifted up and down. I woke up chilled to the bone. Goosebumps covered me from head to toe. It was as if I couldn't get my body temperature to come up. The Marys stared at me, making me feel like I needed to keep talking, which I did. I got this charm from Mr. Prince Charming. I held out my wrist. The Marys brought their heads together and at the same time dropped them down to take a look. Brass! Each one of them gasped at the same time. And a bell! Mary Lynn squealed in a small voice. She dragged the palm of her hand in a long, deliberate motion down her fur. Mm-hmm. Mary Sue's nose curled. She lifted her arm and uncurled her long finger toward me. If you would have listened to your intuition of chills and body temperature— the sound of the ambulance caused us all to look out the police station window. The swirl and twirl of the siren screamed throughout the village. The Karima sisters had their heads stuck out the window of the ambulance on each side. "'You're fine. You aren't going to hit anything. Punch it!' Patience hollered out the window when the ambulance nearly sideswiped a charming cure trying to get up the hill to retrieve the body of the man. "'We have a fresh body to get.' "'June, why didn't you tell me?' Oscar pulled me to the side while everyone was watching the Karima sisters try to get the ambulance up the hill. At one point Patience jumped out and used her arms to flag the way for Constance, who was driving. 
The whipping wind billowed out her house dress, making her look like one of those orange windsock flags you see at the airports. I didn't want to bug you because I didn't even know what it meant. I just found out today that there was some sort of evil lurking, and it was after he came to the shop, I said as fast as I could in a low whisper. He didn't want me to know he was a spiritualist. At least I would have known to be on the alert. Oscar made sense, and it was something I had never thought of. We're married now. You cannot go around keeping your intuition to yourself. And you won't go around trying to figure out who did this. But, I protested. He knew me all too well. There is no but, and I mean you keep your head out of all of this until I can get all of it figured out myself, the right way. He tapped his sheriff's badge. Or not. Colton Lance appeared behind Oscar. He stood around six foot three with big brown eyes and messy blonde hair. There was a pretty young woman with long red hair standing next to him. She was not Ophelia Biblio, Colton's better half. Colton and Ophelia had moved to Whispering Falls from a village out west when Oscar had lost his memory for what seemed like forever. Oscar had given up his heritage and all his powers to save me, yet again. Luckily I was able to get a potion that helped him remember, and since he wasn't technically a spiritualist when I did it, I didn't break any rules. Still, Colton and Ophelia fit into the village perfectly, and the village council made Colton and Oscar both sheriffs, splitting the job. On Oscar's days off as sheriff in Whispering Falls, he was a deputy in our former town of Locust Grove. If he had to work a long shift, he would stay in his old house, but that was rare. "'This is Celia Bouvier,' Colton introduced the woman. She's the attorney for the carnival and will be handling the case of Paul Levy. Paul Levy? I asked. Oscar put his hand in front of me. His eyes gave me the death stare, telling me to zip my lips. Who is Paul Levy? Oscar asked. He's the man she killed. The woman drew her arm in the air and pointed her long green fingernail directly at me. And there is no way we feel you, her eyes drew up and down Oscar, will be able to help put her behind bars due to the nature of your relationship. That is why we have asked Sheriff Lance to take over the investigation. And we want her in jail. Jail? My jaw dropped. June Heel is a pillar in our village. Izzy took a step forward in my defense. She pushed back her long hair and ran her bony fingers down her A-line skirt. Our rules are as follows. Mary Ellen snapped her fingers and a scroll appeared in the air. She reached up and retrieved it, pulling the scroll apart. She read, According to the spiritual bylaws, she cleared her throat, pulled the scroll taut, and held it close to her face. When a spiritualist is accused of a crime, they are to be put on village arrest and unable to work in their shop or perform their spiritual gifts. That is not in our rules, the woman snapped back. Miss Bouvier, it is our rules. Mary Ellen's dark lashes flew down. And you are in our world. Our world? Mary Ellen's words felt like a punch to my gut. What did that mean? When we are guests in a town, we expect to be treated as such, not come to town and have one of our own killed. Miss Bouvier stepped up and stood her ground with Mary Ellen, something I would never have done. And we expect this this. She turned her head and looked down her nose at me as if I were a piece of trash. This so-called pillar of the village to be taken into custody and jailed until the autopsy comes back. As if on cue, the ambulance barreled down the hill and took a leap forward, twisting around in midair, landing on Main Street before zipping up the road, siren blaring as the ambulance made its way to two sisters and a funeral. But not before I caught the glaring eye of one Constance Karima. God help me, I whispered, hoping I could at least get Patience's little problem cleared up so Constance would do everything in her power to find out the real cause of death. Everyone stared at me. The chill from the outside had definitely made its way inside. Don't you dare jail my client. Mac McGirdle stepped through the door. He wore a gray pinstriped suit. Thick, black-rimmed glasses sat on his large nose. Underneath them his blue eyes zeroed in on Celia. Well, well, well. Celia lowered her voice in a mysterious way. It looks like we finally get to have that match in court. Now, now. Colton Lance stood between them. Hopefully it won't get to that. That's right. Celia stepped up. She leaned her body to the right, planted her hand on her hip. A long, lean leg popped out from the split in the pencil-thin skirt. I have enough evidence to charge June Heel for the murder of Paul Levy. He came into her shop as he was strolling around the town, getting ready for his debut on your bazaar, and she gave him a potion to kill him. I didn't know such thing, I protested, pulling my shoulders back. Did he or did he not come into your shop? Her eyes snapped toward me. 
Her tone held venom. "'You can answer that question,' Mac nodded. "'He did, but he didn't tell me he was a spiritualist. There had to be a way around this charade. You are a spiritualist that has the gift of intuition. You should have known by your gift, unless you didn't fulfill your schooling.' She turned her head toward Mac and lifted her brows. "'You can answer that,' Mac nodded again. "'I finished a year and became village president. It was true. I had only gone to Hidden Halls, a spiritualist university, for one year, and completed just enough to get by. But like she said, I used my intuition to work my magic.' "'That is what most spiritualists do, Celia,' Mac had finally decided to take up for me. "'Most spiritualists?' The edges of her lips turned up. Are you saying June Heal is like most spiritualists? We are all spiritualists, Mac shrugged. He used his thick finger and pushed his glasses up on his nose. The friendly banter between them apparently amused her. She threw her head back and laughed in a scornful tone. The June Heal, the chosen one, she asked, lowering her eyes. I, I opened my mouth and nothing came out. It was true, but I had no idea what it truly meant. A while ago I had been named as the Chosen One between the Goodsiders and Darksiders, something about me being able to move the spiritual world forward. I thought merging both worlds together and combining our laws, I had done what I was chosen to do. Chapter 10 It took a lot of fast talking for Oscar to even get through to Colton about setting me free under the law. The Marys refused to let Celia have me jailed, and I was grateful for that, but not without them scolding me first. You know better. You didn't listen to your intuition. You need to go back to university to a new intuition class. Collectively, we all walked across the street to a charming cure, where Colton and Oscar wanted to make sure there was no stone unturned. This is a splendid idea. Mary Lynn was the sweetest of the three. She looked like the little granny with her silver curls tousled around her head. She always wore a black suit and her fox stole. Her voice even dripped with sugar. She eased around a charming cure picking up bottles, opening them, testing the cures on her skin, before smelling them and sticking them back on the shelf. We really all should take those continuing education classes like all the mortals do with their skills. Oh, please. Mary Sue rolled her eyes before dipping her finger into my cauldron and giving it a good swipe. She lifted her fingertip to her nose and took a nice long whiff before she stuck the tip in her mouth. She smacked her lips together. Tasty. Oscar and Colton were busy scouring the shop for any clues Paul Levy had left behind and decided to do multiple tests on the cauldron, the Bushmaster snake, Thuja occidentalis, and the Calendula officinalis to see if there were some poison or other things besides what was supposed to be in there. June has wonderful intuition. Mary Sue couldn't help herself. She took another swipe of the inside of the cauldron, tasting the potion. And I'm telling you she didn't kill this guy. She drew her finger up and pointed toward Oscar and Colton, who were waving their wands over the stress-free potion side of the shop for clues. They are looking in the wrong place. You know as well as I do there are formalities among the worlds. This is a formality. Mary Ellen continued to pick up bottles and put them back, only she never put them back in the right place, which meant more work for me after they all left. I still think you need more school. Mary Sue wasn't as forgiving as the others. She'd always been the brashest of the three and never let me off the hook for anything. I wanted to protest everything they were saying, but I knew better. Any amount of bantering coming from me would only hinder their process more. I just can't ignore the facts. Colton held out his notebook and read from it. Victim did come to your shop and didn't reveal self. Suspect used spiritual gift to read victim, breaking the village law. Suspect did not listen to own spiritual gift to realize victim was indeed a fellow spiritualist from another village, thus breaking the universal law. He paused to catch his breath and continued. Victim was clearly upset when he saw Suspect come to the Gathering Rock Village meeting. Victim ran into the woods. Victim was found dead in the woods, with the suspect standing over Victim. Victim had suspect's potion in his grip, and the potion smeared on his lips. The entire shop felt completely silent. When you put it that way, I blurted out. It's just the facts, which is why I have to put you under village arrest. As soon as those words left Colton's mouth, the shop door flew open, and Petunia Shrubwood rushed in with a scroll rolled up under her arm. She handed Colton the scroll and left, never once looking me in the face. Well, Colton walked over. 
I hate to do it, June, but I just can't let you leave until this gets figured out. I understand the rules. I tried to give him an understanding smile, and I have no other place to go. I stood silent as Colton read the ruling from the village president, only I wasn't listening. I was too busy remembering the fight between Gerald and Petunia outside of the gathering grove earlier this morning. According to Gerald, Petunia was going to bat for the carnival to come to town. Why? What was her connection to Paul Levy? Petunia Shrubwood, our very own president, knew something, and it was up to me to figure out what it was. What about the shop? You know you can't run the shop while the investigation is going on. Colton's words stung me to the core. The shop was all I had, and it would be the only thing to occupy my time. I'm sure I can get Faith to come and help out. I couldn't believe this was happening. I loved this time of year, and here I was feeling the hatred in my soul. And stay here while you go to school? Oscar's voice broke away. School? My jaw dropped. Who was he to ask about school when he never finished his wizard classes? Colton stepped up to talk, but Oscar put his hand out for Colton to stop. I want to be involved, so I have to tell her. There was tension between the two of them. Fine. Colton took a step back. June, you have to go back to school and take a class to continue the education. Levy's lawyer is requesting it, and if we keep her at bay and happy, it gives us time to figure all this out. He waved his hand over the shop. I stood there like a good wife and let Oscar tell me how it was going to go down. Only I didn't see it that way. It was going to go down exactly how my intuition told me it was. This was not the solution. I didn't know the solution, but I knew this was not it. And I knew I had to see Petunia. And what if I could get the village council to grant you a mini-honeymoon, together? Colton had a painful look in his face like he hated to keep me in Whispering Falls under village arrest. There's no way I could leave. I looked over at the Marys, who were gathered in a little circle testing out black-as-night lotion. Just think about it. Colton turned and went back to what he does best, policing. My eyes narrowed. First, Colton tells me I am under village arrest, and then he turns around and offers Oscar and me a mini-honeymoon? A honeymoon was the last thing I needed. I needed to understand what was happening around me, starting with figuring out why Paul Levy was in my shop and how Petunia knew him. Where had he come from? Why me? Why did Paul and Petunia want the carnival here? The thought rolled around in my gut. I let out a little laugh when my intuition told me if I could answer those questions, I would be on my path to freedom. But where? Chapter 11 The fog circled around me. In the distance, the familiar sound of Eloise's incense chain clinked in a rhythmic tempo. Clink. 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 The fog was so thick I lifted my hands and parted it. The path ahead of me was clear. The glow of the carriage lights guided the way. June! Raven called out. I jerked to the right. The fog danced around her as she gripped the ball of dough. The fog coiled around her neck, and in a single tug, Raven fell to the ground. No! I screamed, reaching out into the fog. Only it was a barrier. A barrier I couldn't reach through. Raven! It's not a good idea. Gerald's voice came from the left. I jumped around. He and Petunia were in the fog. I have to, Petunia screamed, her jaw locked. Do not let him in our life, Gerald warned, and tried to grab Orin out of Petunia's arms. Choo-choo! The lights of the train pierced the fog in front of Petunia and Gerald. The roaring train headed straight toward them. Choo-choo! The train's horn roared louder and louder, getting closer and closer to Gerald. Move, move, move! I whispered, knowing they couldn't hear me. I closed my eyes right before the train barreled through the family of three. No! I groaned. Clink! 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 The sound of Eloise's incense sang in the distance. The path in front of me was clear. The fog hung like a shield on each side of me. One, two, three, you are just like me, the sweet voice called me. It was like candy to my ear and hard to ignore. I took a couple of steps toward the laughter of children. The fog parted to the right and a juggler entertained a group of children standing on the sidewalk in front of magical moments. The juggler wore a green bodysuit with a face painted half white and the other half painted the same green as the bodysuit. The juggler had on a joker hat that was white with green jingle bells hanging off the pointy edges. The juggler's shoes were identical to the hat with one big jingle bell on the pointy tip of the toe. 
The children oohed and awed as the juggling pins climbed higher and higher into the sky. Out of nowhere the sound of the train echoed in the distance. Choo! Choo! The roar got louder and louder. Oh, no, I groaned, looking into the distance behind the children. Move out of the way! I screamed. Move out of the— I gulped and turned my head when the train came barreling down Main Street. The screams of children and adults took up the deafening space in my head. I told you June is a good cider, Aunt Helena caused me to look up. She is marrying a park. He's a dark cider, Eloise screamed back at her. Her hand lifted into the air. A big hot air balloon painted with the blood mercy flower. The hot air balloon popped. An explosion of water rushed down the main street like a tidal wave, sweeping the children up. The train disappeared. One, two, three, you are one of me. The voice swirled around Oscar. The tidal wave was going to swallow him up. No! I thrashed back and forth, trying to get the fog to break. No! Something grabbed me from behind and twirled me around. It was Oscar. Only his skin was sliding down, exposing a skeletal face. June, wake up! The voice called me. Oscar's voice. June, it's just a dream. It's just a dream, I whispered to the skeleton that had a grip on me. You're not real, I cried. My eyes burned with hot tears. Go away! I jerked away from the skeletal fingers and opened my eyes. June. Oscar brushed my bangs back from my forehead. His eyes were searching mine. There you are. Come back to me. I blinked. My mouth was dry. My body convulsed. June, baby. Oscar pulled me up out of the bed and held my limp, exhausted body to him. He slowly rocked me back and forth. It's okay, he whispered, sending me back to sleep. Chapter 12 Are you okay? Oscar asked, shuffling down the hall and rubbing his eyes. I'm fine, I lied in a much too chipper voice that sent an alarm to Oscar. The fact of the matter was I was not okay. Being the number one murder suspect in any murder case was not high on my list of okay situations. Plus the nightmare only solidified my fears that some evil was lurking in the foothills of our village. Oscar kissed me gently on my forehead before reaching for his mug sitting on the counter next to the coffee pot. You're mad. Oscar leaned against the kitchen counter with a steaming coffee in one hand. He had to work in Locust Grove for the next twenty-four hours, giving me a little time to figure out my next move without him becoming suspicious. I can tell by your attitude and tone of voice. I'm not mad, I insisted. Okay, another lie. I was roaring mad with my situation. After the nightmare I had had, I knew that I needed to figure out who killed Paul Levy and what grave danger Whispering Falls was facing. You came home last night and went to bed, only giving me a sweet kiss on the lips. He glanced over at Mr. Prince Charming. Then the nightmare. When you're mad, you keep things from me. Mr. Prince Charming was waving his tail in the air and dancing around my feet, happy as could be. But Oscar was right. He knew me all too well. If you were under house arrest for a murder you didn't commit, or had to go back to the university, you wouldn't be happy either. I grabbed a mug from the cabinet and filled my cup up. It was much easier to blame my bad attitude on being forced to go back to hidden halls instead of recalling all the images and feelings from my nightmare. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming was in awfully good spirits for a fairy godcat that needed to get me out of trouble. You and I both know that when you have a nightmare it only means one thing. He set his mug down and propped himself up on the counter with his hand. Your nightmares have a way of connecting past events with future events. It's strange. I had to give him something. I don't remember everything. The truth was I was trying to forget most of the nightmare. It was one of the scariest I had ever had. Thinking about all my friends dying at the hand of something evil made me nauseous. I just remember bits and pieces of me walking through town and hearing the chains on Eloise's incense. Really? Oscar questioned. I could tell he wasn't buying all of it. Yes, really. I threw it back at him. It was hard for me not to be a little upset that I wasn't able to go to my shop and do what I loved. Instead, I had to go to school. I'm going to be late. I grabbed my bag and threw it over my body. We're going to have to discuss this later. I can't be late for class because God knows what the Marys would do to me then. I reached for the door with Mr. Prince Charming by my side. Let me fix you a coffee. Oscar tried to stop me. I can get a coffee at Black Magic Cafe, I said, referring to the coffee shop at Hidden Halls, a spiritualist university. 
I ran out of the door before he could stop me. It wasn't that I didn't want to tell Oscar everything. I just wanted to make sure I was right before I sent him off into the world to fight my battles based on what could be accusations with no merit. My nightmares had had some accuracy before, but not exactly on target. I had to figure this out for myself. "'June, come on!' He ran after me when I walked out the door. I tried to slam it behind me, but he caught it. "'I'm on your side!' he yelled after me as I darted around the cottage and into the woods. Mr. Prince Charming ran ahead of me to the wheat field. "'Trouble in paradise with what's-his-name?' Madame Torres asked me from the bottom of my bag. I dug my hand around the bottom and continued to walk to the wheat field, my portal out of Whispering Falls, and grabbed Madame Torres. She was covered in crumbs from being at the bottom of my bag. Gross! Madame Torres appeared in the glass globe. Her purple eyeshadow was thick from her eyelashes to her eyebrows. The purple turban perched on top of her head had a lime-green-yellow gem in the center. She looked like she needed to be part of the traveling carnival here for the bazaar for her colorful display. Do you need to keep me in the bottom of your bag? His name is Oscar. I ran my hand over her globe to get off all the crumbs and particles of God knew what else that had collected in the bottom of my bag. And if you were a little nicer, maybe I wouldn't just throw you in the bottom. Fine. Her voice dripped like a slow water drip. Her eyes rolled back into her head. How on earth are we going to get you out of this mess? Aren't you my crystal ball? Look into the future. Tell me what to do," I asked, and shook my head. Behind me the village was still at yawning peace. Ahead of me the tall wheat waved in the morning wind. The chill in the air nipped at my neck. I pulled the edges of my cloak up around my neck and over the edges of my hair. Maybe it was good I wasn't able to make my appointment with Chandra. Unfortunately it was for awful reasons, but the longer hair was keeping some of the wind off my neck. Mr. Prince Charming trotted ahead of me. I could only see the tips of his ears and the tip of his tail as it swayed along with the wheat as if he were dancing in the morning dawn. There was a distant line where the dark stopped and the light began. Soon all of Whispering Falls would be up and milling about in the warm sunshine of the chilly day. Without me. "'My plan is to play nice in the daylight and figure out who really killed Paul Levy,' I said to Madame Torres just before the wooden sign popped out of the ground and several wooden arms shot out in all sorts of directions. The wooden arrows pointed in different directions. Hidden Halls of Spiritualist University had several different signs. Classes didn't start for a while, and I wanted to get out of my cottage. Aunt Helena was probably up having her tea, so I touched the arm that showed me the way to the university. Like magic, the wheat field parted and made the perfect path. At the end of the path, in the distance, the main street that ran through the university was just waking up, with a few students walking around. The first stop I had to make was Black Magic Café. There were only a couple of students ahead of me. The fresh smell of scones and coffee drifted through the café. "'What can I get you?' Gus asked and wiped down the counter. "'I'll have a fresh blueberry scone and large coffee.' I smiled when he looked up with a shocked look on his face. He ran his hands through his ash-blonde hair. It was a lot less shaggy than normal. Gus Chatham had on his regular cargo shorts and surfer-style look. He stood about six foot tall and was thin. His brown eyes sparkled when he smiled. I had no idea. He tapped his temple. Gus's spiritual talent was clairvoyant medium. He generally had a good idea when I was coming to visit at the university. I guess I threw you off. I winked. I guess you haven't heard about my little trouble. No. He gasped and poured the large cup of coffee. And by the sound of it, you need this. He pushed the cup toward me before he took the tongs and grabbed a fresh-baked blueberry scone. Yum. My stomach growled. The blueberries were plump and a little soft, and had the just-out-of-the-oven look. The top was lightly toasted brown, and the edges had a nice crispness to them. Looks delicious. They are. He slowly nodded his head. I'll be right over. I took a seat at one of the picnic tables. I had a choice of them all, since the students coming and going were doing just that, going to class. Gus had walked over to another Black Magic Café employee and said something in her ear. He untied the apron from around his neck and took it off, putting it behind the counter. "'Trouble in paradise?' he asked, as though Madame Torres had gotten to him. "'What makes you think that?' I asked, giving him the stink eye. I pinched off the edge of the scone and popped it in my mouth. "'Good, huh?' Gus smiled. "'Anyway, you are here way too early for a newlywed,' his brow cocked in a curious way. 
I have to come back to school. It was like eye rolling and the word school went together. Every time I said school, my eyes automatically rolled. Why? His head pulled back. The Marys told me to. I pinched off a bigger piece this time and put it in my mouth. There's a traveling carnival in Whispering Falls for the bazaar. One of them came into my shop. My intuition went off and I did what we do. I took care of him and sent him on his way. And? Gus encouraged me to go on. I went on with my day. I did tell Constance Karima I would go see her sister, which I did, but not without telling Petunia I would babysit Orin. I smiled. Every time I said his name, his little man mustache popped into my memory. At least you're smiling, Gus returned the turned up mouth. Oh, no. I shook my head and curled my hands around the hot cup of coffee. I took Orin with me to see Patience Karima. I didn't bother telling him why I had gone to see Patience. It had nothing to do with why I was at the university. Orin got a little restless, so I hurried to the Gathering Rock, where there was an impromptu meeting Petunia was holding, since she's the village president. "'I'm getting older every second you talk,' Gus's head dipped. He stared at me with a pained expression. "'Can you get to the reason you're here?' "'I am,' I whined. "'Anyway, the guy from my shop, Paul Levy—' His name was forever ingrained on my brain. He was at the meeting. He saw me and took off. I followed him into the woods. "'You mean—' You ran after him to see why he didn't tell you he was a spiritualist, too? He sucked in a deep breath and leaned back on the picnic table bench. Wait. I put my hand out in front of me and laid it on the table. He was dead when I got there. Dead? Gus's face contorted. Nervously, he ran his hand through his hair. Heart attack? He asked with a quiver in his voice. No. I shook my head. Well, maybe. I hadn't thought about that. He had my potion bottle in his grip, and there was evidence of it on his lips. "'Making you look like an immediate suspect.' His jaw jutted out. His eyes narrowed. "'Unbelievable,' he puffed through his nose. "'And they just suspected you as the murderer?' The fact that he was fine and dandy moments before I found him looked bad. The potion was open, in his hands and on his lips. Not to mention I completely broke rule number one of the bylaws. It just didn't look good. Hearing myself say it out loud made it sound even worse. "'When you lay it out like that, you're right. It doesn't look good.' His eyes glanced over my shoulder. His chin jumped in the air. "'I've got to go help out. It's getting busy.' He stood up and took a step toward the front of the café. He stopped. "'But that doesn't tell me why you're here.' His hand was planted on the picnic table. "'The lawyer for the traveling carnival insisted that I go to school to hone my craft while I'm on village arrest, because I obviously broke the rules.' I wanted to protest to him, but the fact was that I had broken the rules. Regardless, my intuition told me to, so maybe Celia Bouvier was right. Maybe my intuition wasn't exactly right on target, and I've just been lucky these past couple of years. June? The familiar voice of Aunt Helena circled my head and into my ears. I turned to see where she was. She stood on the sidewalk in front of Black Magic Café. She wore a long red cloak to match her pointy red boots. She waved. Her long red fingernails flashed up and down before she scurried over. "'To what do I owe this pleasure?' she asked. I got up and hugged her, tight. It felt like I was safe, comfortable, home. "'What is wrong?' she asked, squeezing me tighter to her. "'I can feel the sorrow.' Without warning, tears sat on my eyelids and trickled down my face. She pushed me gently away and held me out at arm's length. Fear rested in her eyes. She reached up and brushed the tears away from my cheek. We sat down, and I used the opportunity to ask the questions that had been swirling in my head. "'Aunt Helena, I have to ask you a very important question, and I need a serious answer. I knew it was a long shot about her being behind any of my misfortunes lately, but the little tickle about the conversation I had with Bella and Bella's baubles needed to be scratched. I know that you were having an issue with my wedding to Oscar because of everyone wanting everyone to perform certain rituals. I didn't spell it out because she and I both knew what I was talking about. Mr. Prince Charming brought me this charm, and I can't help but think that with all the drama from the wedding this could have something to do with it." She stiffened. She drew her shoulders back. Her eyes pierced the distance between us. I mean the whole good-sider and dark-sider having a baby and not knowing what spiritual gift they might possess. I was going to go on about the possibility that she might have been the root cause of the charm, even though I knew deep down it was the whole Paul Levy murder. But I had to exhaust all possible reasons for this. "'I love Oscar. I do. 
But I did tell you that you needed the ancestral dance at midnight to get the good cider blessing. It was the I told you so moment Aunt Helena had been dying to give me since I had said I do and had not given in to her and Eloise's ritual demands. It's not my marriage. I brushed the back of my hand along the bottom of my nose. I, I'm a suspect in a murder. What? That is what you were accusing me of? You think I would murder someone to make it look like my own flesh and blood did it, just so you wouldn't have a baby with a dark cider? Aunt Helena jerked back and drew her cloak up over her shoulders. That is a low blow. What? No, I, I don't think you murdered anyone. I'm just asking questions to figure out what the heck is going on in my world. I'm just asking— I held my hands out in front of me to try to diffuse the electric energy between the two of us. She glanced around before grabbing me by the arm. Come with me. I did what she told me to do. I had nothing better to do, and if she could shed some light I was in no position to not listen. She dragged me through the café and out into the street. She hurried me down the sidewalk, across a pathway that led to the small yellow cottage that had window boxes under each window, overflowing with geraniums, morning glories, petunias, moonflowers, and trailing ivy, leaving a rainbow of colorful explosion. The awning flapping in the chilly breeze read Intuition School, in lime-green calligraphy. The small schoolhouse brought back fond memories of when I had first learned of my spiritual gift and how to use it. I tried to bottle that feeling and hold deep inside the pain I was feeling. Aunt Helena flipped on the lights, illuminating the interior filled with a few rows of tables and a couple stools per table. I ran my hand over the front table where I used to sit. It was here that I had met Faith and Raven Mortimer. Raven! I gasped. My body shook with the feelings I had while I was deep in my nightmare and dismissing Raven as she held the ball of dough up in her fist, exactly as she had done yesterday before I ran to the gathering rock and this nightmare started. Do you remember something? Aunt Helena swept up next to me. I think I need to see Raven. My gut told me my words were right. Before I rushed to the gathering rock to give baby Orin back to Petunia, Raven tried to stop me. I ran my hand over my wrist and touched the brass bell charm. Back up. Aunt Helena pulled out a stool, pointing for me to sit. She pulled up the other one and sat down, facing me. I'm not following you. Quickly I filled Aunt Helena in on what had happened, all the details of Paul Levy, why I was at Hidden Halls, and I also gave her insight on my nightmare. Then you must see Raven, and visit everyone who was in your nightmare. They hold the answers to all the questions surrounding the death of this man. Aunt Helena confirmed what I had felt. She might have some insight. Her eyes drew down to my wrist. "'Brass bell?' Aunt Helena asked with a frosty tone. "'Yes,' I answered bleakly. "'And you got this before you chased after Mr. Levy?' Aunt Helena asked with a condescending inflection. "'I know, I know,' I shook my head in shame. "'You've got to start listening to your familiars,' Aunt Helena's brows rose. "'Yes, she does,' Madame Torres chirped from the bag. Starting with her, Aunt Helena pointed to my bag. And that is easier said than done. I pulled Madame Torres out of my bag and sat her on top of the desk. I understand that, but you have to listen to them and your nightmares. They are part of what makes you and creates your spiritual gift. These are what make you who you are, good or bad, she said, and got up from the stool. She circled around the room, gathering all sorts of items, before she proceeded to the front of the room where she kept a cauldron. She flipped it on and sprayed a few spritz of the cauldron cleaner in it before wiping it out. Intuition class was really fun. Aunt Helena put together all sorts of potions and the students used their intuition, along with their senses, to figure out who or why someone would need that potion. I have no idea who Paul Levy even is, I shrugged. But I do know that I need to see Raven and find out where this carnival travels from. Maybe there's something in his past that will connect me to something. Unfortunately, I was afraid the train was the link, and I knew it deep in my gut. Madame Torres swirled and twirled, sending her face off into a tornado inside her crystal ball. The blue and purple swirled into a black cloud mixed with flecks of gold, turning into a sea of silver. The storm inside her ball calmed to a slight wave. Students filed into the cottage one by one, filling the stools. I didn't bother paying attention to who sat next to me, because I was too busy watching Madame Torres's calm, wavy sea turn into a roaring choo-choo train. The same roaring the train had in my nightmare. 
June? The tone in Aunt Helena's voice was not pleasant. Sort of unhappy, to say the least. You have to pay attention in class. She swept from one side of the schoolhouse to the other in a fluid motion. Her red cloak swept the floor behind her. How can you learn anything new if you keep daydreaming? I wasn't daydreaming. The images of Madame Torres continued to play over in my head. The only choo-choo I had ever seen that looked like that one was when I had to go to a Zarkabam, a place I didn't intend to visit in this life again. "'Then what do you call this?' She stopped, put her hands under her chin and let her eyes focus off into space. "'That was how you looked. I was listening to my intuition like you told me to do.' I grinned and ran my hand over Madame Torres. I think I just might know who I need to see about Paul Levy. "'Using your familiar is the ticket to success,' she snapped her fingers. "'Ticket,' I groaned. "'If only you knew how much I didn't like that word. The last thing I wanted was a ticket to a Zarkabam. The last time I had gone there I had been jailed and Mr. Prince Charming helped me dig my way out. It wasn't a place to visit for the fun of it or for vacation. It certainly wasn't somewhere I wanted to go for a honeymoon.' Chapter 13. How could I not have thought about this before? I questioned myself on my way back from my class. Aunt Helena and I had said our goodbyes with a promise from her that she would help me in any way she could. Aunt Helena had powers beyond I could ever imagine. I'd put money on it that she was busying herself right now with trying to figure out who Paul Levy was. When she accused me of daydreaming there was no way I was going to tell her about what had actually popped into my head, Eloise Sandalwood. The clinking sounds of the chains from the incense burner Eloise was swinging back and forth gonged in my head, along with images of her lips, as she cleansed magical moments. I stopped at the wheat field before I reached the sign pointing the direction back to Whispering Falls. Mr. Prince Charming turned and looked at me before he sat down facing the way home. I reached in my bag and took out Madame Torres. I held her up to my face. With my other hand I slowly rolled my hand over her. It was time to get some much-needed answers away from the other people in my life, and my intuition took over as I let my hand float without thinking. I see the waves of water. I see enlightenment that is going to provide me answers that I need. I see a gifted person with keen logic and natural intuition giving me insight my intuition will not allow. The words flowed out of my mouth as Madame Torres took over my voice. This person will have a great influence on your present situation to get to the heart of the matter. The person is the key to the answers you seek. The poisoned one was going to help you. He had a message for you. He was stopped. The evil has taken over. The words continued to come out. The waves disappeared and the train appeared. Have a wonderful day, blessed be. Just like that, Madame Torres's ball went black. A jolt to my core caused me to step back. I gripped Madame Torres and sucked in a deep breath of fresh air, filling my lungs as much as I could and slowly releasing through my mouth. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming sat down at my feet and looked up. I'm fine. I shook my head and put Madame Torres back in my bag. That was a new one. Over the past couple of years Madame Torres showed me things, but nothing where her words took over my voice and I had no control over it. When I had come to Whispering Falls and found out I was a witch, Izzy told me that over time my gifts would sharpen. It was definitely time to stop by and see her, but the first person on my list was Eloise. I touched the wooden arm that read Whispering Falls. Stalk by stalk the wheat began to disappear. Vibrant pink Iceland poppy jumped out of the earth, followed by complimentary fuchsia ground-cover Erica. With each step I took closer to home, a new fall and winter flower or ground cover paved my way. Yellow English primrose, yellow winter jasmine, snapdragons, and purple ornamental kale, to name a few. All the colors created a beautiful picture around me and Mr. Prince Charming. The aromas helped clear my soul and add just enough positive intuition that I began to feel better about my situation. If I listened to Madame Torres, there was someone out there who wanted to help me besides Paul Levy, since Paul wasn't going to tell me anything now. Who was that? The poisoned one Madame Torres talked about was Paul. What did Paul try to save me from? Who was he saving me from? All these questions rolled around my head. Mr. Prince Charming was probably already halfway down the hill to Whispering Falls by the time I made it to the wooden sign at the end of the path. 
The sign read, Welcome to Whispering Falls, a magical village. When I passed the sign I turned around and all the colorful flowers were gone. It was just the wheat field. I took a sharp right and walked deeper into the woods on my way to Eloise's house. Whispering Falls was originally a good cider community, which meant any dark cider had to live on the village outskirts. When I was village president I merged both worlds and now dark ciders could come and go as they pleased. But Eloise continued to live in her home in the woods and I didn't blame her. Not only did she have plenty of land for her herb garden, she was surrounded by beautiful nature and peace that no village, no matter how small, could give her. Most days I found Eloise's house a nice getaway, but today I needed answers. The mid-afternoon sun shone between the two trees, exposing the two-story house built on a platform high off the ground. A set of wooden stairs led up to her cozy wrap-around porch where Oscar and I loved to enjoy our after-dinner tea when she had us over for dinner. I walked around the side and noticed the lanterns that hung from the trees were still lit. It was strange, since it was daylight. Still, I followed the lanterns to the gravel pathway where I could hear the drowsy daisy flowers humming along with the chilly wind. Along the path leading to Eloise's garden were beautiful flowers planted on both sides with pops of vibrant purple, green, red, orange, and yellow flowers. Wisteria vines provided a canopy leading to Eloise's exquisite garden. Rows and rows of herbs were neatly planted and proportioned perfectly with small wooden signs naming the herbs. Mandrake flowers, rose petals, moonflower, mandrake root, seaweed, shrinking violet, dream dust, fairy dust, magic peanut, lucky clover, steel rose, and spooky shroom were just a few she had planted. Eloise, I called when I made it to the end of the mandrake root row and saw the top of her head. June, she popped up. There was some dirt smeared on her cheeks and nose. I've got to get these shrinking violet bulbs pulled up before it snows even more. She stood up with a small purplish ball with dangling roots in her hand. She tossed it into a bucket and then brushed her hands off on the apron tied around her waist. To what do I owe the pleasure? It's probably not as much of a pleasure as I'd wish. I tried to smile, but the edges of my lips just weren't going to cooperate. Oh dear. She came closer. That doesn't sound so good. Is my nephew okay? Perfect. Now that did make me smile. I guess you haven't heard that a member of the traveling carnival for the Winter Bazaar has been found dead. Oh my, that is awful. She gestured toward the gazebo at the edge of the garden. I followed behind her. I had no idea there was a carnival joining the bazaar. A death sure does put a damper on things. Damper? I wish it were just a damper. I'm the number one suspect and under village arrest. Suspect? she questioned. Her back was to me as she stood next to the table under the gazebo. The table held two three-tiered stands. Each plate had a different pastry on them. I reached around her and picked out one that looked like a pumpkin spice cupcake. I glanced over at Eloise. Her eyes were staring and blank. Her fingers fiddled with each other. I saw you doing an extra cleanse in front of magical moments. I took a bite of the cupcake. I mean, I took another bite and mumbled. Madame Torres keeps showing me a train. The last time and only time I was on a train was when Arabella Paxton moved to town and her father Gerald was trying to marry Petunia, only he was still married to Esmeralda, who happened to put a spell. I remember. Eloise stopped me and put her hand in the air. So you knew something was going on with Arabella and you didn't tell me? I asked and casually poured myself a cup of hot tea. I had no idea you were involved. She eased herself into the chair. Her face was blank. My incense does its thing. I'm chained to it, not the other way around. Well, you can tell me now. I sat across from her in the other café chair. I had this interaction with a yellow ball during the two sisters and a funeral cleanse. The wind carried the ball to magical moments. It was a sign. She drummed her fingers on the table. I had no inkling of a clue a charming cure or you were in need of a cleanse. Raven, the yellow ball, Paul Levy, all definitely had a connection. The train. I gulped. The train was the connection between the two worlds of good and evil. Evil would win if I didn't take matters into my own hands. I'm in need of more than a cleanse. I wished it were that easy. My intuition told me I was going to have to get to the root of the issue before I could even begin to have another suspect. Did the wind tell you anything else? Eloise might believe the wind sent the little yellow ball when I knew it was the ghost boy. Was he just playing with Eloise? 
Why would he still be bothering her after I had made it clear the night of my wedding for him to stay away from her? All I do is listen to the wind. I don't try to read into the spiritualist part because of the pesky law. Eloise had always played with the spiritual rules, and still living on the edge of the woods proved it. And now I wish I'd put a little more into the process since you are—' She teared. I reached over and placed my hand on top of hers. Her fingers stopped drumming. Her emerald eyes slid up to mine. I bet Oscar is fit to be tied with me. Eloise withdrew her hand from underneath mine and wrung them together. Oscar doesn't know. I bit my lip and took a drink of my tea, staring into the cup to avoid any type of eye contact with her. June Heal! Eloise's voice escalated, forcing me to look up at her. You are his wife! I understood when things got a little hairy and you kept things from him before you said I do, but not now. He can't know that I'm taking things into my own hands, I protested. In fact, the lawyer for Paul Levy is making me go back to intuition class. Can you believe that? I asked, and sat back in my chair. Did you say Paul Levy? The look of fear struck deep in Eloise's eyes. I did, I confirmed. My intuition didn't need to tell me that Eloise had heard of Mr. Levy before. Her reaction told me. Do you know him? I asked, and sat straight up. In a former life, she gulped. Tears sat on the edge of her eyes. Did you say he is gone? Gone? I asked, wondering if she didn't hear I had said murdered, dead. As in no longer living? Her words came out as though each one was a little bee and stung her lips as it passed. I simply nodded my head. The pain of my simple nod stabbed her. She curled her body over the table and rested her head on the edge. Softly her shoulders moved up and down, a small whimper escaped her. I'm sorry, I whispered, though I did not know what I was sorry for. As far as Paul Levy was concerned, I was angry with him for coming into the shop and letting me believe he was immortal by not identifying himself. How did you know him? I figured it was better for her to talk about it, instead of keeping her sadness bottled up. We were once engaged. Engaged? I asked, stunned. But I thought— You thought I lived here all my life, in the woods, alone? Her eyes softened. The edges dipped down. You only know me from what you remember as a child, and from what I've told you about Darla. But I did have a life before." Her words faded. The parks? It was like I could see it. You didn't live here until Oscar was orphaned and sent to live with Jordan? Oscar's parents were murdered, and he was sent to live with his uncle Jordan in Locust Grove. But this was before my father had been killed. Oscar and Jordan had lived in Locust Grove before Darla and I moved there. You had a life, but you moved here to be near Oscar. I knew my words were right. They came out of me like a fountain. Yes. Paul didn't want to leave his Arkabam and the comforts of the Darksider life. He didn't want to be an outsider of Whispering Falls. Images of the two of them together formed in my mind. I didn't blame him. What would he have done? Sat around here and tended my herb garden? The train. My mind reeled with the images of Madame Torres. I think the answers I'm seeking are in Azarkaban. You can't go there. Eloise's voice boomed across the table, shaking it, as though the earth quaked below us. There has been such unrest since the last time you went, and I can only assume Paul left and joined the traveling carnival to get away. Didn't he know you were here? I asked a simple question. Probably not. She stared down again. I never told him goodbye. When we discussed taking in Oscar it was just too much for him. He said he needed time, and I understood that. It's hard for a man to take in someone else's child, but I thought he'd come around. Only I didn't want him to be forced to make the decision, so I took the train here and kept my distance. The rest is history." He did seem very interested in our wedding photo. I was beginning to remember what Paul and I had talked about. When Oscar and Colton had asked me about my conversation with Paul, I didn't think something like him noticing my wedding photo was a big deal. Turned out, it seemed like more of a big deal than I imagined. The one with me, Oscar, Aunt Helena, and you. Did he say anything? She asked. Hope sat in her words. He just asked if you and Aunt Helena were our mothers. I told him you were the aunts. I smacked my hand on the table. But he did ask where your husbands were. What did you say? She asked, as if we were teenagers sitting on the bed exchanging boy stories. I sort of said that the two of you were set in your ways, and he laughed. I looked up at her. Paul Levy was a very handsome man. Yes, he was. Eloise looked down. I have a feeling there is more to why he was here than meets the eye, if what you say about money and stress was true. You think someone saw him come into my shop, 
Or maybe someone in my shop was a spiritualist and knew I had made a potion for him? And they had something against him and took the opportunity to frame you for it. She made a lot of sense. But what was Paul into that would cause someone to want him dead? That is the million-dollar question. I sat back in the café chair and brought the teacup up to my lips. I knew Petunia Shrubwood held some of those answers. After all, it was she who insisted the carnival come to the Winter Bazaar. Chapter 14 There were so many people I needed to see. Petunia, Patience, and Raven were at the top. Narrowing down who was my first stop was a toss-up, since each of them seemed equally important. But— I glanced down the hill over Whispering Falls. Dusk was quickly coming up on the village. My eyes slid toward two sisters and a funeral. Instantly I knew I had to get the Magical Cures book. "'The ghost boy has been here a couple of months,' I said to Mr. Prince Charming, as though he was going to open his mouth and answer me back. I let my mind wander. Strange things have been happening since he's been here, and that little yellow ball that he likes to play with keeps showing up in my nightmares and around my familiars. I ran my hand down my bag. I can kill two birds with one stone. I smiled, knowing the two were connected. Figuring out how to get the boy to the other side has to be connected with why Paul Levy was here. Plus, if I get him to the other side, Patience will return to her normal self, making Constance happy. Mr. Prince Charming did his signature figure eights around my ankles, letting me know I was on to something. It was like a puzzle. I knew I had most of the pieces, but how they fit together was an altogether different story. The back door to a charming cure was unlocked, and I had to slip in and get the magical cures book if I was going to try to get to the root of Patience Karima's little ghost problem. The little boy had shown up right before All Hallows' Eve, long before Paul Levy came along. If I could find something out about the little ghost boy, I might have a clue as to why Paul was murdered. The door opened into the back storage room that I used for storage and a little sitting room. Sometimes potions took longer than expected and I had a little sofa and refrigerator in there in case I had to stay later in the evening. I had stuck the Magical Cures book under the couch one night when I was working on a new arthritis homeopathic cure. Darla had always kept the journal next to her in the shed outside of our house in Locust Grove when she made her homeopathic cures. It wasn't until I had come to live in Whispering Falls that I realized the old tattered leather-bound book was actually the Magical Cures book. Darla had written in the creases and around the pages, and since she wasn't a spiritualist, the cures didn't talk to her like they did to me. She was keen enough to know that I would eventually need the journal for my future. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming appeared out of nowhere, nearly causing me to jump out of my own soul. You freaked me out, I whispered and shook my finger at him. I flipped the light on and walked over to the door. Faith was still in the shop. It sounded like she was cleaning up and refilling the shelves. It was closing time, and I had limited time. I rushed back over to the couch and bent down. Sticking my hand under, I felt around until I felt the leather-bound journal. I pulled it out, immediately put it in my bag, and took Madame Torres out when she glowed. I sat on the floor cross-legged and put her in front of me. I waved my hand over her and she appeared. The globe filled with purple smoke and yellow lines like static coursed through it. Images of the brass bell charm Mr. Prince Charming had given me rocked back and forth in a rapid movement. Choo-choo! Madame Torres's ball chimed, and the insides began to churn in irritation. They seek you to finish out their evil. Turn to the water. I watched in horror as the globe turned to dark blue waves, the bell gonging in the depths, a train coming right toward the angry sea that was alive in Madame Torres. The waves crashed against the globe. The storage room lights busted, sparks flew, the train exploded inside of Madame Torres, the sea and waves calmed. The bell was still ringing slowly to a staccato back and forth. The Magical Cures book flew open. The pages were flipping so fast my bangs fluttered across my forehead. I steadied myself by placing my hands on the floor and waited for the flood of wind to pass. In an instant everything fell silent and calm. The book was open to a page that read in scrolling calligraphy, The Demons of Crimson. I placed my elbows on my knees and bent over the book. This was how it worked. The book had a magical element I had discovered once I took possession as a spiritualist. When I needed a special ingredient or potion, I could count on the book to open to the right page. If a mortal outside of the spiritual world would pick up the Magical Cures book, it would just look like a journal with Darla's handwriting. I read aloud, 
The Demons of Crimson will keep you or a loved one protected. The earthly possession is required in order for the protection to take place. Words from the tongue are not the cord to the protection. Rather be, thee must have a physical attraction that will bind until the earthly possession is complete. Madame Torres's insides twisted and turned in a fit of rage. The unsettled waves crashed and careened up against the glass ball. Train tracks appeared deep within the water as the lights of the train glowed bright, extending out of the ball and flooding the room. The sound of the train's horn echoed so loud I placed my hands over my ears and watched in horror as the train crashed at the edge of the ball into what looked like another big wave. Everything fell silent, deafeningly silent. Darkness enveloped me. The sound of my breathing thundered in my ears. Even Mr. Prince Charming sat as still as a rock. Neither of us knew what had just happened or what that even meant. "'What on earth?' Faith stood at the door into the shop. The lights illuminated her silhouette. "'June, is that you?' "'It is.' I grabbed Madame Torres and stuck her back in the bag. "'I wanted to make sure you were okay.' "'Really?' She flipped the light on and it flickered a moment. "'You need new bulbs.' "'I need a lot of stuff,' I laughed. I ran my hand down my bag. "'And I hope you keep this little incident between the two of us.' "'Of course.' She hurried over and put her arms around me. She gave me a big hug. I do have to tell you something that I found very interesting today. It might help you." What? I asked. Petunia came in here. Her eyes grew. She was looking for a mojo bag for protection for babies. For Orin? I asked, and wondered why Petunia would need one. She said something about evil lurking. I asked her if it had to do with you and she wouldn't answer. And when I asked her if she wanted me to get you to make a special bag just for Orin, she adamantly said no, that she came in because she knew you weren't here. Faith's words went into my brain and stayed there. I knew I had to analyze every word, but I knew the truth. Petunia was mad because I had Orin strapped on me when I came upon the dead Paul Levy. Not to mention, Petunia had some very valuable information she was keeping to herself. I just found it odd that she needed a mojo bag for him. Faith turned when the bells over the front door clinked. Oh, she put her hand out. I better go lock the door. I stood quietly, rubbing my hand down my bag. When my hand hovered over the magical cures book, it warmed to the touch. I crept over to the door into the shop and looked out the crack. It was Raven. She had two pink and green striped Wicked Good Bakery bags in her hand. The two sisters whispered between them. Raven's eyes looked at the storage room door. Faith must have told her I was there. Raven's high-heeled, black pointy boots clicked and she started walking toward the door, her eyes tight with tension and a determined look on her face. I stepped away from the door, letting her come in. June. Raven took a deep breath, trying to relax. I've been trying to get in touch with you all day. Please tell me you have a June's gem in one of those. I really needed my tasty treat to help soothe my stress level. I have one, but it isn't good. Raven looked at me with an intense but secret expression. She handed me one of the bags filled with a handful of June's gems. The other bag she kept clutched to her chest. Tell me, I begged to know. I remember you trying to stop me yesterday, but I had baby Orin and he was so fussy. I just wanted to get him back to his mother. Raven looked at Faith. Faith nodded. Raven opened the bag and pulled out a lump of beige dough. She slapped it on the coffee table in front of the couch and bent down. Her hands kneaded the dough. It looked exactly the same as Mr. Prince Charming when he sits on my lap and kneads my leg. Raven had the ability to interpret and read signs left in dough or even in her mixing bowls. Her gift was a luromancy. She had seen many things in her dough since I'd known her and had been accurate each time. She used her hands to spread the dough once she was satisfied. She used her finger to cut one inch around the edges. She picked it up and curled it in a ball. With a quick whip of her hand, she threw the ball down and it stayed in the perfect round shape. She picked it up again, this time throwing it harder on the table. Nothing. Then she threw it on the top of the dough she had kneaded and flattened. The ball stayed in the round shape but turned yellow. Train tracks appeared in the dough and the ball rolled down it like it was a train. The ball stopped at the edge of the dough and the dough fluffed up into what looked like a wave on each side. There, Raven pointed. What do you see? she asked. I see a wave, which wouldn't be too surprising since Madame Torres had been showing me waves. Come here. She pointed me to move my body to a different side of the table. What do you see? Oh, my God! I gasped. It was like everything had been transformed. Is that a mustache? 
Yes, just like the one Faith said Orin has. She looked up at me. Her brows drew in an agonizing expression. As much as I want to say this had nothing to do with the man they found dead, I just can't rule it out. So are you telling me that Petunia knew this, Paul? I asked, keeping the yellow ball thing and how I already put two and two together that Paul was connected to Petunia to myself. That was nothing new, but the why Paul and Petunia were connected was important, and that was what I hadn't figured out yet. Do you know how Paul and Petunia are connected? I asked. Asking Raven was the most direct way to get the answer. I leaned over the dough and took a nice long look, hoping to see something like Raven, but all I saw was gooey lumpy dough. I'm saying they are connected somehow. I'm just not sure how. Raven didn't offer me any solution. She pointed to the ball that was resting at the edge of the dough. I do not know what this yellow ball of dough means, but I'm telling you to be careful. I nodded. I did. It only confirmed that Patience's little ghost friend, who had been here a couple of months, was connected to this whole situation, and somehow to Paul. Well, I must go. She stood up and gathered all the dough into a big, messy pile of goo before she stuck it back in the bag. I have to get ready for the bazaar, since I've now cleared my blocked mind by giving you this bit of information. Isn't it strange how magic can just block our minds? Faith asked her sister. Hello? I waved my hands in the air. Did you forget that I'm the one on village arrest and the one who is being charged with murder? I have no doubt this will all be cleared up. Faith nodded. I wouldn't be so sure. The negativity dripped out of Raven's mouth and onto my skin as if a snake were crawling all over me. The extra mojo bags I had made up and stored caught my attention. One of them lit up like my ingredients for potions did when I absolutely had to use one. Without question, I walked over to the extra supplies and grabbed the cheesecloth bag I had made for a memory mojo. I stuck it deep in my bag, wondering what I would be using this particular memory mojo bag for. Chapter 15 There wasn't much sleep being had around my little cottage. Mr. Prince Charming couldn't get comfortable, not even with Oscar's side of the bed open, since he was still on his twenty-four-hour shift in Locust Grove. Even the inside of Madame Torres tossed and turned, creating lights around my bedroom. Several times I had gotten out of bed and walked out the door to get in the green machine, my 1988 green El Camino, and zoom out of town toward Locust Grove, only I knew the Marys would get wind of it and then I'd never be able to figure out who really killed Paul. Madame Torres chirped a message from Mac McGirdle that he wanted to see me for lunch and we could meet at the Gathering Grove today. I was sure he wanted to catch me up on the investigation in Paul's death and what to expect. I made a mental note to add him to my list of people to see. He should have been the most important, but he wasn't. Petunia was. It was still dark out, even though it was almost dawn. It was the perfect time to head down the hill to Whispering Falls and go unnoticed. Are you ready? I asked Mr. Prince Charming and ran my hand over my charm bracelet before I grabbed my cloak and tossed it around my shoulders. He danced in front of the door. I strapped my bag across my shoulder and out the door we went. Petunia was sitting in the middle of the shop with Orin strapped around her while she did her ritual. She would sit on the floor and all the animals that lived in her shop would line up so she could brush them, give them a treat, and get them ready for possible adoption. Only I had no idea who would want to adopt a squirrel. There were so many questions I had for her, but not sure if it was the right time. She probably was still mad about Orin being strapped on me when I came across Paul. Still, I couldn't ignore the evidence presented to me. First, the mustache on Orin was quite strange, and the mustache, along with the train in Raven's doe, was something I just couldn't ignore. But the train was the most disturbing. That exact train was the one I had taken to Azarkabam and found out that Petunia's then husband-to-be, Gerald Regula, was in fact from there and still married. Maybe Petunia didn't know everything that was going on, but I couldn't dismiss the fact that Orin had a mustache and the demons of Crimson just so happened to do a protection spell, but you had to have a physical scar until the deal was complete. Coincidence? I didn't think so. Stop! I swatted away the group of fireflies that darted around my head, trying to distract me from looking into the window. Clyde, Petunia's pet macaw, lived in the display window. His head was tucked under his wing as he slept on his wooden tree perch. Go bug someone else, I instructed the teenagers, or go to bed, it's almost dawn. I was hoping to get them to leave me alone. Just like teenagers, they didn't listen to me. In the spiritual world, your spirit could always come back in the form of an animal. 
I wasn't quite clear on how it all worked, because it was Petunia's gift. She was an animal spiritualist. She could read them and helped lost souls become them. Fireflies were the perfect body for teenagers who have left the living. Like teenagers, they stayed up all night and slept all day. Plus, they were always nosing around in my business, just like now. Seriously, I growled at them and batted my hand in the air. Mr. Prince Charming danced on his hind legs and swatted them with his front paws as if he were batting a string. I looked back in the window. Crap, I groaned, because Petunia was standing in the window, Clyde sitting on her shoulder. She stared back at me and wiggled her fingers in the air. She walked over to the front door and unlocked it. Good morning, June. I'm assuming you're here to see me. Petunia held the door for me to come in. Clyde's beak was buried in her brown, messy bun on her head. He pulled his head out and had a carrot stuck in his mouth. I should have been surprised to see a carrot come out of her hair, but I wasn't. There was an entire forest up there. The scary thing would be if she tore her hair down and brushed it. That would be something to see. I wanted to come by and check on Orin. I ran my hand down the book. For some reason I was needing some courage. Instead of feeling the outer edges of a book, the crackle of the wicked good bag alerted my senses. I stuck my hand in my bag and pulled the sack of goodies out. I came with treats. I dangled the bag in front of her. She smiled. She used one hand to take the bag and the other to rub on Orin. I am still mad at you. She sucked in a deep breath. I did not kill that man. My brows rose. She stuck her head out the door and passed me. She turned it side to side. Get in here before someone sees you. She grabbed me and tugged me inside. She locked the door behind us and gestured for me to follow her to the corner of the shop where there was a real tree. She curled her hand in the air and suddenly we were surrounded by the light of the fireflies as they filled the branches of the tree. Um, I looked around. I had never seen so many fireflies in one place. If they were alive and teenagers, it would be like I was at a rock concert surrounded by them. What is going on? They're on the lookout. She bit her lip and took out a June's gem from the bag. She closed her eyes and chewed slow. These do help melt the stress away. Why are they on the lookout? My own stress level was rising. I grabbed for the bag and took a June's gem. I've done a bad thing, and I think the death of that man was because of me. Her eyes clouded with hazy sadness. What do you mean? I asked and leaned a little closer. This could be the answer I needed. It's important if it shows I didn't kill him. There was no way I was going to let her off the hook. I had come here for answers to why everything my familiar was telling me was pointing me to this family. Well, she gulped, do you promise not to go nuts on me? I do have my baby here. Tell me. I could feel myself losing patience with her. A few weeks ago Mr. Levy came to the shop to see me. I thought he was here to look into purchasing a pet, but he wasn't. He was here to promote the carnival. Her words were chosen carefully. It was very creepy. How so? I encouraged her to continue. He said that he was happy to meet the village president and wanted to have his carnival here during our bazaar. I explained to him that the bazaar was just for our shops to be open, and it was so cold that I'm sure the rides wouldn't go over well with tourists, but he insisted they only did carnival acts like juggling. Having them would sweeten the pot. He told me that if I did approve the carnival, he'd make sure Orin was always protected throughout his life. She looked down at Orin. He was still asleep and snugged up against her. You don't understand. Her eyes saddened. Orin never sleeps. I'm so tired that I need to protect him from me. You? I reached out and rubbed her arm. You're a wonderful mother. No, I'm not. Because— She looked up at me with veiled, liquid eyes. I let that man put a spell on Orin. Spell? I asked, knowing that the Demons of Crimson was exactly what Paul Levy had done to Orin. Yes some sort of promise that I would bring the carnival here in exchange for Orin's lifelong protection, only Orin had to have a physical mark that would go away after I made good on my promise. She picked Orin up out of the snuggie and turned him toward me, adjusting him in her lap. I agreed, and Paul Levy put a mustache on my baby. Everything that Madame Torres told me was right. What on earth did Gerald say? I asked. He doesn't know, she whispered. I jerked up. My eyes lowered. Had I heard her right? I'm sorry. I shook my head. There was no way I heard her right. Did you say he doesn't know? He does not. I was just so upset with no sleep that I had to do something to keep Orin safe from me, she cried. He's sleeping now, but come the middle of the night when I need sleep, he doesn't. 
Gerald doesn't seem to mind, but I'm losing my mind. Let me get this straight. All her words were up in my head and I had to straighten them out. You're telling me that Paul Levy came to Whispering Falls to see if the carnival could come here for the bazaar. When you told him we didn't use a carnival, he suddenly offered you this protection from yourself for your baby? He said something about animals and how much love they can give and how we love them like our own children. It was then that I had confided in him about Oren not sleeping, and I felt like I was going out of my mind. She sucked in her bottom lip. The edges turned down. Then he told me about this protection, and all I had to do was get the carnival here. Something wasn't adding up. Why did he want the carnival here so bad? I asked. He said that he and a bunch of other spiritualists had retired and were going around doing these carnivals. Their livelihood depended on it. He said that the extra work would help him connect with his child better. And since he understood how I felt, I trusted him, she said. When I put it on the docket for the bazaar, I didn't realize I had to go through hoops from the Marys to get it approved. So that was why there was an emergency meeting. Things were adding up layer by layer. She slowly nodded her head. The gnawing inside continued to eat at me. The more I thought about it, the more I truly believed Paul Levy was here on different business, and it had to do with me. But what? I ran my hand around my wrist, feeling the brass bell charm. And now that he's dead, I don't think I will ever get this reversed. She ran her finger over Oren's manstash. And that's why you bought a mojo bag. Everything was suddenly becoming a little more clear on how Petunia and Paul were connected. Paul is dead, so your deal is null, which means the protection is no longer in place, and it means that the mojo bag is to help protect Oren from whatever evil lurked and killed Paul. My mouth dropped, and my eyes slid toward Petunia. Unless you killed Paul. Me? Petunia screeched, offended. Yes, you. I got up and walked around the shop, talking out loud to myself. You and Gerald are not sleeping. You aren't thinking correctly. Paul put this mustache on Oren, not only causing problems between you and Gerald, but making Oren the talk of the town. I drew my hand in the air and pointed at her. Which you do not want people talking about your baby. What mother does. June Heel, you have lost your mind. She jumped up and fisted her hands. Have you forgotten that it was your potion found on his lips? You were the one who broke the bylaws, not I. You knew Paul was in my shop. I saw you looking when he left. My mind snapped back to seeing her in the street, watching as Paul left the shop. It was perfect for you to set me up. Not that you wanted to, but your family's at stake. I twirled around. She was face to face with me, her nose tipped up on the end, her lips pinched together. And that gives you the perfect setup to frame me. I did no such thing, she spat. What do you want for me to prove it? I want you to answer some questions. I had Petunia right where I wanted her. My intuition told me she didn't have anything to do with Paul's death, but I knew she could help me. Fine. She crossed her arms across her chest. What? She sashayed back under the tree. I followed her. What does Gerald think about Oren and how he got it? I asked. A leaf floated down from the tree. I looked up. Mr. Prince Charming was sitting on a branch next to a squirrel. I watched as the squirrel cracked a nut and held a piece out in its claw. Mr. Prince Charming ate it. The squirrel dropped the nutshell, barely missing Oren's head. He thinks it has to do with our heritage and maybe our DNA. You know, kinda like the childhood illnesses the mortal children get, only this is in the spiritual world. And I just can't tell him that I put this curse on our child. She adjusted Oren in the crook of her crossed legs and picked up the nutshell. She inspected it and stuck it deep within her hair. He forced me to take him to the doctor and everything. The doctor tested Oren for hormones and all sorts of stuff. They even asked if I knew anything, and I said no. That was when Paul Levy was alive. I was sure the mustache would go away the first day of the bazaar, when the carnival acts were walking around our streets like Paul had promised. Paul Levy gave you a spell. I took out my magical cures book and opened it to the Demons of Crimson page. I handed it to Petunia. She lifted her hand and plunged it into her messy hair. She pulled out a pair of reader glasses and stuck them on the edge of her nose. Her lips moved as she read the words printed on the page in front of her. This is not good. Fear hung on each word that left her mouth. She lifted her hand to her lips and used the other to rub on the kangaroo pack strapped to her as Oren wiggled a little. I can't believe I did this to my baby, she cried out. It's going to be okay. My heart ached for her. I took her into my arms and let her silently cry. I rubbed her back. I know you and I didn't kill him. 
Someone wanted him dead. He knew something and someone didn't want him to tell. "'What are we going to do?' she asked. "'If anyone finds out what I've done, I will be banned as village president, and worst of all, I've put my family in danger and Gerald would never forgive me for that.' "'Still have the carnival at the bazaar,' I suggested. I knew I had to travel to Azarkaban, but if I didn't find the answers I was hoping to find there, maybe the answers had to do with someone he dealt with in this carnival. I don't think so, not without the Marys agreeing to it, and without Paul Levy, who would I communicate with?" She asked a good question. I don't know, but I think I might be able to find out. I bit my lip. The words I was about to say made my stomach hurt. You have to let me travel. You have to take me off village arrest, because I think I know where Paul is from. If I can go there, maybe I can find other people in the carnival." "'I don't know, June,' Petunia shook her head. "'I know that if the Marys found out I let you do that, I'd for sure be banned.' "'You have no option,' I reminded her. I tapped my finger on the Magical Cures book to remind her of the Demons of Crimson deal she made with Paul. "'June Heal!' she gasped and drew back. Her eyes lowered. You are a very bad good cider. No, I'm not. I shook my head. You are protecting your family, and I'm protecting mine. The words hung between us. Chapter 16 Petunia was hesitant to give me a leave pass from the village arrest and knew she'd receive some sort of discipline from the Marys for doing it, but she agreed. There obviously were no boundaries, and nothing Petunia wouldn't do for baby Orin. We agreed that I would carry on today as if I were on village arrest and meet at midnight when the train for Azarkabam left the station. My plan was to meet with Mac McGirdle at lunch. In the meantime, I was going to go back to see patients. The yellow ball was vividly involved in my nightmare and familiars. I had to figure out how Paul and the yellow ball were related. The street was filled with tourists, shuffling in and out of the shops with heavy coats on. Today the snow had stopped, but the air was much colder. The wind had picked up and blew the snow from yesterday around in swirls and curls around the street, giving the illusion of a snowstorm. I grabbed the edges of my cloak and tugged it around me, shielding me from the wind. I hurried up the steps of two sisters and a funeral. Mr. Prince Charming batted the door, pushing it open a crack. I pushed it open wider. Hello? I called inside. Patience? Constance? Constance hurried out of one of the rooms. She had on a plastic apron and goggles perched up on the top of her head. She peeled off the yellow plastic gloves and waved me in. "'Get in here before you let that cold in,' she grumbled, and headed back into the room from which she came. I had been into that room once before and wasn't looking forward to going in there again. Clearly she wasn't going to come back out and talk to me, so I had to put my fear of looking at a dead body aside. "'What have you found out about my crazy sister?' Constance asked when I walked into the room. The concrete floor had puddles of water on it near the drain, underneath the steel table, where one dead Paul Levy's body lay. Constance put the goggles back down on her face, making her eyes appear even larger than they already did in her thick glasses. She picked up some sort of hook tool on the metal tray and did some sort of poking and prodding to the body. I sort of felt sorry for him. Here he is. Constance continued to take samples from the body and stick them in little vials. And if you think Patience is helping, you're nuts. She's out back playing with that ostrich." She lifted her hand and pointed the hook toward me. "'I don't know if it's a good idea that you are here, since he's here because of you.' "'I didn't kill him,' I glared at her and kept my eye only on her. "'You are going to figure out what did kill him, right? I'll move much quicker if you fix my sister,' she threatened and glared back at me. I walked over and looked at the clipboard on the counter with Paul's name on it. "'Don't be so nosy. Constance shuffled over and grabbed it. His history is none of your business. How did you get it? Is there a next of kin listed? This was all information I was sure I could use. You will have to fix my sister first to get this information. She hugged the file close to her body. Her eyes lowered. Fine. I jerked around and left the room. I didn't want to stay in there much longer anyway. Mr. Prince Charming and I walked back out the front door and down the steps. The sounds of a hissing ostrich led me straight to the back of the funeral home, where Constance said Patience was. Patience had on an orange cloak. Today her tight curls had little flowers stuck in them all over her head. The ostrich's neck flung forward as its beak plucked a flower from her. Her body shook like jello as she giggled. The yellow ball was near her feet. Patience, I smiled when I walked up. Oh, you! 
She rolled her eyes and turned away from me. Do you have any answers yet? No, but I think some answers are right here in the funeral home, and I need you to get them for me. It wasn't going to be easy, but I had to bribe her. I pulled out the bag of June's gems from my bag that was left over from yesterday and held it out in front of me. I will give you these treats from Wicked Good if you find out who the next of kin is for Paul Levy. I need you to whisper it into the air so Madame Torres hears it and relays it to me. And you are going to give me those? Her hand reached out and she snatched the bag. And take you to get a caramel apple? I reminded her about the carnival. I so hoped they were going to have caramel apples. Fine. She tossed her head to the side. The ostrich jutted forward and grabbed another flower from her head. She giggled. I need to know if your little ghost friend has always had the yellow ball. Or did you have the yellow ball here? I asked. It showed up the same day he showed up. She kicked the ball away from her foot. It rolled right back. Have you ever tried to take the ball away from him? I asked. He gets mad. Kind of like at your wedding. She reminded me of his bad behavior that was not something I wanted to recreate. Patience! Patience, I need you to help me roll the body, Constance screeched from the back door. Her eyes bugged out underneath the goggles. Roll the body. Patience's foot knocked the ball when she scurried off. The ball rolled after her, but I stopped it with my foot when it tried to roll past me. I picked it up and gripped it in my fist. It looks like it's me and you, I said into the air. Wow, wow, Mr. Prince Charming hissed. The hair on his back stuck straight up and he darted off. His disapproval was apparent. You're going to go with me tonight. I stuck the ball in my bag and headed off in the direction of the gathering grove. Chapter 17 The gathering grove had a line out the door when I got there. The knock on the front window caught my attention. Mac McGirdle had secured a two-top table right in front of the window just inside. "'June, how are you?' Gerald asked when I stepped through the door. He was cleaning off the table near the door. Two women were still sitting there. I'm good. I noticed he had picked up the teacup and slowly moved the cup in a circular motion. I do want to ask you something. Mac McGirdle lifted his hand in the air. I waved back to acknowledge him and gave him the pointer finger I'll be right there gesture. Mm-hmm. Gerald's eye focused on the cup. He twirled a little faster. Interesting. His brow cocked. The two women were deep in conversation and didn't notice Gerald was using his gift to look into one of their futures. One second. He looked at me and bent down to the ladies. He said to the woman who looked to be in her fifties, "'Can you please check your phone? I think someone is trying to get in touch with you.' She gave him a strange look. She put her hand on the cell phone that was face down on the table. She picked it up. There was nothing there, but a second later her phone chirped. "'Look there! There's a text message from my daughter.' The woman quickly swiped her finger across the phone. As she read the text, her lips moved and then curved into a smile. She's pregnant. The medicine worked, she told her friend. Congratulations, Gerald puffed up. I just had my own child, little boy. Congratulations to you, the woman gathered up her stuff. We have to go. I have to go see them. Before she left, she turned to Gerald. How did you know, she asked, a curious look on her face. I didn't tell anyone that my daughter was going to the doctor today to see if the medication the doctor had given her and my son-in-law worked. She hadn't texted me when you told me to check my phone. I have no clue, Gerald shrugged. He curled the edge of his mustache between his two fingers. Here is a gift. He pulled a couple of tea leaves from the front pocket of his gathering grove apron. Be sure to have her steep these two leaves in hot water when you see her next. Let her enjoy a cup with a teaspoon of honey. The woman's face was blank and slightly tilted to the side. Softly she said, I will. Her friend grabbed her arm and pulled her close. I told you this town was magical. They scurried out into the chilly day. Now what can I do for you? He finally turned to me. Did you know Paul Levy before he approached Petunia to be part of the bazaar? There was no sense in dancing around the question. I had little to no time. I did. His chin lowered, then lifted. But I hadn't seen him for twenty years until he was at the Gathering Rock right before he was found dead in the woods. How did you know him? I asked. He lived in Azarkaban when I did. I had left, as you know. He gestured around the tea shop. You didn't think to tell anyone that you knew him in the past? I asked. Who would care? You were the one standing over him, not I. He lowered his eyes down on me in an accusing way. 
Besides, we never had a beef with each other. None? I asked. He shook his head. Then why didn't you think it was a good idea for his traveling carnival to come to the bazaar? I tapped my finger to my temple. I clearly recall you and Petunia standing right out there when I babysat Orin for you, and you saying it wasn't a good idea. June Heel. Are you accusing me of killing Paul Levy? He drew his hand to his chest. I'm just trying to explore every possibility, because I have no reason to want him dead. I didn't know him. I never met him a day in my life until he waltzed into my shop, disguised himself as a mortal. But you—' I pointed to him. "'You knew him in the past, and you didn't want him here. That could be worth exploring,' I asked. "'Does Petunia know you knew Paul?' "'I—uh—' he burst out in a cough. His jowls flapped back and forth. I turned on my heels, leaving Gerald to think about what I was saying. "'Good afternoon,' Mac harumphed and greeted me when I made my way through the crowded café and sat down. He took his thick finger and pushed his glasses up on his nose, his blue eyes magnified. "'Good afternoon,' I smiled and adjusted my seat closer to the table. It was lovely to see the small vases on each table filled with Arabella's new holiday flower, Blood Mercy. Since Gerald was her father, she kept the gathering grove so vibrant with fresh flowers daily. I picked one out of the vase and stuck it in my hair. It made a very nice accessory on a dreary day. "'What was that about?' Mac asked, nodding toward Gerald, who was rushing over to us. "'Hello, hello!' Gerald stood over us with a china teapot adorned with little rosettes all over it. He placed two saucers and teacups in front of us. "'What can I get for you today?' "'I'll have the soup of the day,' Mac pointed to the menu. "'I'll have the same,' I said, and took the strap of my bag over my head and hung it on the back of my chair. Gerald lifted the teapot and poured the steaming tea into the cups. A few leaves fell from the pot. I lowered my eyes and looked in. Gerald's spiritual gift was a tea-leaf reader, and he was well known for being nosy. I wasn't so sure he wasn't trying to get a little reading off of Mac and me. After all, he probably wanted to know what I had up my sleeve with the information that he knew Paul before. I'll have some water. I looked up at him and pushed the teacup aside. He hurried off in the direction of the counter that was backed up. You have him flustered, Max smiled. And if I know you, which I do, you know something. First you tell me what you know, I encouraged him. It was more important to me to see what he had uncovered in my defense. I am still waiting on the report back from the Karima sisters on the autopsy. Max started out telling me something I already knew, since I had just come from there. I should probably let Mac know all that I'd found out, but then he'd keep a close eye on me, hindering me from going to his Arkabam at midnight, and that was something I was determined to do. Well, I did find out something very interesting. It was a teaser for him to go and chase a lead that I knew was a dead end. Paul Levy and Gerald knew each other years ago. I'm not sure if they were friends or not, or how they knew each other, but they did. In fact, I knew Gerald was not happy Paul wanted the carnival to come to the bazaar, and where I come from, if you're friends, you want to help them in business. Not Gerald. He gasped. His eyes grew even bigger under his thick glasses. How did you know this? He grabbed his briefcase from the floor. It shook the table when he plopped it down between us. I asked him. It wasn't brain surgery. Mac looked over his glasses at me. And Paul was engaged to Eloise. How do you know this? He asked again, more dumbfounded than before. The morning of the murder I saw Eloise give an extra cleanse to the village. I conveniently left out the part that tied magical moments with his Arkabam. Not that magical moments was involved with Paul's murder, but that was how the spiritual world worked. We got clues and we had to put them together, which led me to Eloise and the tie between the two worlds. I couldn't help but go ask her about it after I'd been put on village arrest. "'Any clues on why she did the extra cleanse?' he asked. No. She said that she was just the vessel for the incense and wind to do her spiritual job. I sucked in a deep breath and hoped Mac would take my lead and run with it, ignoring me for the rest of the day. She had no idea about the murder, and when I told her and said his name, she became very pale, and that was when she told me about her past with him. This is very interesting. He looked up at me before he bent his head back down to the folder he pulled out of the briefcase and began writing down what I was saying. I also remembered something. I stopped talking when Gerald came over and put the soup down in front of us, along with my glass of water. When he left, I said, When Paul was in the shop, I found him looking at my wedding photo. He did ask about Eloise and if she was a mother to Oscar or me. I told him who she was and he seemed to be taken aback. He scribbled faster and faster. I didn't tell him about how I watched Paul leave and the interchange between him and Petunia. 
I needed Petunia's story all to myself because I had to keep her close to me, at least until midnight. I know you don't want to believe Eloise could do any harm, but the facts remain. Mac put the folder aside and picked up the spoon in his soup. He took a couple of sips. Darksiders are from an evil side. If this Paul was a darksider and had a tie here, maybe he was here to see her, and maybe they had an exchange in the woods, where darksiders mainly live, and she accidentally killed him. Oh, no. I shook my head. This was not going as planned. I didn't want Eloise to be charged with murder. I only wanted Mac to research the lead of Paul and Eloise until I could get some solid answers without him on my back. I think maybe she can give some insight to who he is. I don't think he knew she was here until he saw the photo of my wedding. I did the best I could to get Mac to buy into the fact that he needed to stop watching me and focus on other possibilities. This definitely needs to be given to Colton and looked into. Mac slurped his soup. I'll leave Oscar out of this since it's his aunt. He took another slurp before jumping up. Wait! I stood up, knocking my chair over. My bag skidded across the floor. I didn't say she needs to be looked into by the police. Are you kidding me? Madame Torres's voice was a high sonic stiletto only I could hear. If you don't get this crazy yellow ball out of your purse, it's going to drag me all over this village. My mind was jumbled trying to get Mac and my bag to stop, both going in different directions. Stop it! Madame Torres yelled. Stop bumping into me! Mac! I screamed out. The entire café fell silent. All eyes were on me. At least Mac stopped shy of the door. <clears throat> Are you okay, June? Gerald cleared his throat. His lips tipped into a nervous smile. Our eyes met for a split second. My bag dragged across the floor. A collective gasp blanketed the café. I told you this village was magical, the woman next to me whispered to her friend. Magical? I tried to play it off. Oh, no. I shook my head and giggled nervously before running over to the bag, stomping my foot on the strap. I bent down, picked it up, and stuck my hand inside, pulling out the ball, but first noticing Madame Torres was lit up with words. I dropped my bag and the ball just kept rolling. I held it up in the air for everyone to see. No magic here. With bag and ball in hand, I turned around to confront Mac. He was gone. The door left slightly ajar. What can I get you? Gerald's voice broke the silence of the café. I looked at him, gave him a weak smile, and took a deep breath of appreciation. Look! The woman who had whispered to her friend pointed at me. The ball exploded out of my hand and shot out the door like a rocket. Chapter 18 Get back here! I darted in and out of the crowded streets after the bouncing ball. I'm not kidding! The ball bounced here, there, and everywhere. There was no doubt in my mind that the little ghost boy had come into the gathering grove and taken the ball. Out of thin air it was gone. The ball was no longer in my sight. Dang! I ran my hand through my hair. My eyes darted back and forth, taking another look. June? The high voice of Ophelia Biblio caught my attention when she said my name. Her curly, honey-colored hair cascaded down her back, giving me hair envy. She stood on the steps of Ever After Books with winter garland in her hands that she twisted around the wrought-iron railing on each side leading up to the bookstore. On each step there was a three-foot-tall nutcracker. Instead of them holding a rifle, they were all holding holiday-themed books. My favorite was a Buckingham Palace Royal Guard holding Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Are you okay? I mean, she gave a sympathetic smile. The khaki awning with ever-after books written in purple flapped from the wind above her head. The khaki color reminded me of Paul Levy's pants, and Ophelia reminded me of Colton. No. I shook my head and looked down at my cloak, wishing I had put on a different outfit. I was so eager to get out of the house to see Petunia, I had thrown on an old pair of jeans and black sweater with snow boots. Ophelia had on a pair of skinny jeans tucked into a pair of knee-high, low-heel brown boots. Her red plaid waist-length coat was form-fitted to her figure by a matching tie around her waist. Why don't you come in and let's talk? She set the garland in her hand down on the step and held her hand out to me. I do have plenty of time. I smiled and reached out, taking my friend's hand. And I could use a girlfriend's ear. You know you have mine. We slowly walked up each step. You have really outdone yourself this year, I said, looking over her head. She was only five-five to my five-eight. Ever After Books was one of the most popular stops in Whispering Falls. She catered to tourists of all ages. The bookstore even hosted book clubs from surrounding towns or just girlfriend get-togethers. 
Of course she had food that was catered from the gathering grove and wicked good. "'What is this?' I asked, when I saw the note taped to the door that read closed. It was the middle of the day, and the day before the bazaar. She put her hand on the doorknob of the shop. Before turning it she said, "'I'm so light on inventory I had to put in a book order, so I decided to take the day to get the shop ready for the bazaar.' We stepped inside the shop and immediately I ducked to miss a flying book that grazed my shoulder. I was still not used to flying books, no matter how magical the shop. Books swirled, dip, and dove throughout the colorful shop. Each of them had their own colorful wings, creating a rainbow of colors throughout the shop. There was a lamp post at the beginning of each aisle that gave a spotlight to the bookshelves that were filled with books. Big comfy couches with large fluffy pillows and baskets of snuggly blankets in all sorts of bright colors were in each corner of the shop, allowing the customers to sit and hang out and enjoy ever after books as long as they wished. I followed her to the counter, making sure to keep an eye out for the flying books. "'Hear ye, hear ye!' Faith Mortimer's voice swept across the airwaves as she delivered the Whispering Falls Gazette. We are excited to announce the traveling carnival will be here tomorrow to bring jugglers, carolers, carnival foods, balloon artists, and many more fun carnival acts to the bazaar. This ad was brought to you by Glory Bee Pet Shop. Be sure to stop by for all your pet care needs and send your customers to Glory Bee for a 5% discount during the bazaar. Jingle bells played into the air, giving Faith a little time between headlines. That's new. Ophelia tapped her toe to the music. I agreed, but what was more exciting, I was happy to hear Faith's news. This meant Petunia had listened to me and somehow gotten the carnival to still come. Who did she talk to? Obviously it wasn't Paul Levy. The Whispering Falls Police Department would like you to come forward if you had any contact or had even seen Paul Levy the day leading up to his murder. There is very little evidence of Mr. Levy's whereabouts and the police need your help. Please see Colton Lance if you saw Mr. Levy or had any sort of interactions with him during his brief time in the village. This was brought to you by the Village Council, where they are keeping us safe and sound in our little magical town." Faith giggled before she signed off. "'Happy Holiday Bazaar! Let's get our magic on!' "'That is why I'm not okay.' I groaned and plopped down on one of the couches. Ophelia stayed behind the counter. She'd grab a book as it flew past her, log it, and let it go. The book went to the shelf it was supposed to go to. Faith's message put my intuition on high alert. Even with Paul's death, evil still lurked in our village. I could feel the tug on my gut. When Faith said the carnival was still coming, I instantly felt dizzy. The evil was still barreling our way, and it had to do with the carnival. It was more important than never to get to a Zarkabam and figure out what Paul Levy was doing in Whispering Falls. Colton did say that it didn't look good, but we know you. She looked up. We know that you wouldn't hurt a fly. Thanks. But Colton was right. The evidence points to me. I looked off in the distance. Two books were fighting for a prime spot on the front shelf. Stop it! Ophelia clapped her hands together. I jumped. You are books one and two in that series. Work it out. The books twirled around each other again before they finally took spots on the shelf. Watch out! Ophelia blurted out in a half giggle when a book the shape of a ball whipped through the air. I ducked just in time for it to hit the back of the couch and land on the cushion next to me. That must be meant for you. She chuckled at my near-beheading book fiasco. My heart beat so fast I put my hand up to my chest to keep it from beating out, and with the other I reached over and grabbed the book. It wasn't a ball. It was in the shape of a globe. I'm not so sure it's for me. I pushed it to the side. Why on earth do I need a globe book? I don't know but my books have a way of picking out their owners, so humor me and take it." She grinned. Fine. I stuck the book in my bag. Your books are kind of crazy. They get so competitive. She shook her head and went back to logging the books flying around her. Anyway, back to you and your little situation with Paul. Let Colton do his job. Other people had to see Paul Levy besides you and Petunia. Petunia? I asked, being nosy. Of course. She is the village president who called the meeting. He somehow had to see her. I told Colton there was more to the story than Paul Levy wanting to come to the bazaar. If that was the case and he was in charge of the carnival, they'd book months in advance, not days." She lifted her head, her eyebrows cocked. "'Thank you,' I jumped up. I've got to go. But—' Ophelia sputtered behind me. I didn't wait to hear her finish that thought. There was no time to waste. There was no reason I couldn't try to summon the train immediately. 
I ran down the steps of Ever After Books and took a left on the sidewalk toward Glory Bee. The pet store was probably a close second to Ever After. People loved books and animals. The store was busy with people feeding the animals in the tree. Squawk! Hi, June! Squawk! Clyde the macaw flapped past me, landing on the tree branch next to Mr. Prince Charming. Meow! Meow! Mr. Prince Charming greeted me. June! Petunia greeted me with a very disciplined tone. Listen, I bent over and whispered, I don't have time. I've got to get to the train right now. Now? She grabbed me by the arm and dragged me behind the tree. What do you mean, now? I thought we said midnight when no one will see us. I understand that you have a lot to lose, but I do too, and this investigation is going nowhere. If I don't hurry up, then Eloise, me, and you are going to go to spiritual prison, and that is not going to happen if I can help it. I don't know. Nervously she put her fingertips in her messy hair. I just don't know if I can give you a pardon. Do you want to get divorced? I threatened. Do you want Orin to grow up without a mother? June! Her face contorted. Are you threatening me? I'm not only threatening you, I'm threatening the village president. I knew it was a bold move, but something had to be done. Mac was already on his way to see Eloise, and I couldn't have her arrested. Colton was going to start looking into Petunia, and not to mention anyone else coming forward that had seen Paul and Petunia together. "'Did you not hear the news?' I asked her. "'I don't subscribe any more, because if I'm sleeping, which is rare, then I don't want to be woken.' Petunia crossed her arms. "'Why? Did you approve any sort of announcement for the Gazette?' I clearly remembered hearing Faith say it was sponsored by the village council. I don't know. She brought her hand to her mouth. Oh, my God! Gerald had me sign a piece of paper, but I didn't read it because I was so tired. Well, you approved an ad for the Gazette asking anyone who saw Paul while he was here in Whispering Falls to come forward with any information or anyone they saw interact with him. I pointed to her. I saw you two interacting in front of my shop when he left with his potion. I could easily say that you saw him in my shop and framed me. Or I can go to Azarkabam and try to find some answers to help us all." Fine, she grumbled, and stuck her hand inside the cloak she was wearing to pull out a scroll. I was going to give it to you later. She jabbed it toward me. I took it and without another word I rushed out of her shop, with Mr. Prince Charming on my heels, up the hill toward the wheat field. Chapter 19 The gray clouds hung over the village. The snow had begun to fall. It was fresh, puffy, and lay clean on the wheat field. Meow. Mr. Prince Charming's long white tail was like a finger and pointed to the wooden sign with the picture of a train. I guess we are going on another train ride. I reached out and tapped the arm. I held the scroll that gave me the temporary pardon and stuck it down in my bag. Madame Torres glowed. Oh, no. I had forgotten Madame Torres had a message for me. The inside of my bag chirped. My cell phone. I'd completely forgotten about it. I reached in and took it out, forgetting about Madame Torres, and read the text. It was from Oscar. Oscar. How is your day? I'm thinking of you. I hope you're okay. Work is crazy here. Christmas shoppers galore. I'll be home tonight. Tonight? I gasped, realizing his twenty-four-hour shift would be over. Quickly I texted back. Me. Great. I'm helping Petunia feed her animals tonight. I'll be home after that. I sure wished I was going to be home. I wasn't planning on staying in Azarkabam like I had done a year or so ago. In the jail. I was planning on asking a few questions and getting out. Oscar. Love you. Don't worry. Colton has got some really good leads. Me. I'm not worried. I love you. I flipped the phone shut and threw it back into my bag. We've got to hurry, I said to Mr. Prince Charming and smacked the finger again. The sky was not only gray, but we were losing daylight. Like magic, the wheat field parted, exposing the old locomotive I had ridden on before. "'All aboard for Azarkabam!' The same conductor hung out of the engine window like he had done before. "'Woo! Woo!' The train whistle screamed, steam blew from underneath the big hulk of metal, and the metal wheels came to a screeching halt. "'Here we go!' Looking back, I took one long look over my shoulder. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. The heavy stench of evil filled my lungs. It was still around. I knew what I had to do. Mr. Prince Charming and I climbed up the lit stairs and through the big, heavy metal doors in the only passenger car attached to the engine. Once I reached the top of the steps I looked back again toward the wooden sign and the direction of Whispering Falls. There was a tug at my gut. There were answers to be found, and Azarkabam was the only place I was going to get them. The shrill noise of metal wheels turning to get us going grew as they turned on the tracks, picking up speed. 
Mr. Prince Charming and I took a seat on one of the two red velvet benches. Mr. Prince Charming wasted no time curling up and then closed his eyes as our adventure was about to begin. I rubbed my hand over each one of my charms, remembering all the protection I had surrounding me, and my familiars. Madame Torres! I suddenly remembered her glow. I reached in and pulled her out. It's about time. I'm glad you got it now before it was too late. She let the text from Patience scroll through her ball. If you get me stuck in some thrift shop— Shh! I was having a hard time concentrating on reading the note. Paul Levy is divorced from Yancey Levy. She lives in Azarkabam. They have reached out to her as next of kin, but she has not responded. They have no children. Paul recently retired from owning a toy shop called Dots. The ball went black. Dots, I confirmed. I must find a shop called Dots. As I put Madame Torres back in my bag, my hand grazed the globe book from Ever After Books, tickling my intuition. Hmm. I pulled out the book and looked at Mr. Prince Charming. He pushed out his front legs into a long stretch and yawned. He sat up on his haunches and licked down his front legs, tapping the book before he pulled them back to stand up straight and tall. This book really picked me? I cocked my head to the side, giving Mr. Prince Charming a glare. Meow, meow. The sound was barely audible between the rattling of the benches and the clicking noise behind my head. The mini tassels on the red velvet window shades clicked against the passenger car windows like the sound of poetic rain. I peered outside at the particularly dreary scenery as it passed by. The large castle on a hill that was located in Azarkabam was off in the distance. I knew the dungeon there well. It was a place I was not going to be visiting on this trip. Thoughts of Oscar and our new life filled my head. There was no time to daydream. I had to find that toy shop and find some answers. The train picked up speed. The wheels beneath me shook the passenger train floor. The tassel swooshed back and forth. I held on to the red velvet bench with one hand and opened the globe book with the other, turning to the contents page. It seemed like the logical place to start, but nothing was very logical in my world right now. My finger drew down the page and I quickly read the words, trying to figure out what I was supposed to find. The places didn't read Kentucky, Alabama, or Tennessee. It was strange names I didn't recognize. Strange places I didn't recognize. Azarkabam. My finger stopped midway down the page and dragged across to see what page number. Twenty. I closed the cover again to take a closer look at the book, and it was still a picture of a typical globe. Nothing special. The pages flipped beneath the pad of my finger. My eyes scanned the page number, stopping at page twenty. My phone chirped from the bottom of my bag. Without looking, I was sure it was Oscar letting me know he was safe and sound in Locust Grove, or he was probably bored and checking in. Instead of looking, I decided to check out the Azarkabam map. I rubbed my hand over the map. Underneath my fingers the landscape became bumpy and three-dimensional. I couldn't help but smile. It was definitely a book to keep. Ophelia was right. This book was meant for me. Dot's toy shop was on the far north side of the village, and this map was going to get me in and out. Suddenly everything stopped. The noise of the wheels, the tassels hitting the glass, the creak of the metal, and Mr. Prince Charming snoring. I looked out the window again. It was pitch black, exactly like I remembered it. Get out! The gruff, not to mention scary voice that I remembered from last time screamed, I said get out! The heavy metal door flew open. I said get out of my house! The gruff voice wasn't messing around. Just like you did last time you were here. The last time I was here the train didn't stop at a train stop. It stopped in this guy's shed, exactly how it had today. I'm sorry. I shut the map book and stuck it under my arm. I threw my bag over my shoulder and stood up. I walked down the steps with Mr. Prince Charming next to me. The guy wasn't as scary as he was the last time. I have no idea why the train must stop here. Me either. The man lifted his hand. His beard was much longer than last time and he was much more humped over. Go! The smoke flew up in the air along with the flames from the barrel fires where the same men in black cloaks, mustaches, top hats, and dark-lined eyes stood around it like they did last time. They reminded me so much of Gerald. Well, well, it looks like you're back. One of them recognized me. If it weren't for that white cat, I might not have had a greeting crew here to meet you. What do you want this time? The man grinned, exposing his toothless gums. I'm here to look for a toy shop called Dots. There wasn't anyone better to ask than them. Dots, huh? Another man took a long draw of his cigar and made an O with his mouth. He puffed out little dots in the air. The smoke lifted above his head and formed into the word dots. 
"'Yes,' I confirmed and pointed toward town. "'That way is north, right?' I asked, gripping the edges of the book. They knew I was some sort of spiritualist, but I wasn't so sure they were as welcoming here as Whispering Falls was to our tourists. "'Yep, but not sure if it's open.' Another man stepped forward. He was younger than the others. I heard the owner was murdered. "'Murdered?' another one of the men asked. "'Paul Levy?' "'Yep,' another added. "'Damn shame!' He shook his head. Vigorously he rubbed his hands together, brought them to his mouth, and blew on them before sticking them in front of the barrel to warm. Yancey was leaving him because he just couldn't get past their loss. I'd heard Paul had decided to get revenge. "'Revenge?' I asked. All the men looked at me. "'I mean, I'm not sure if I should go to the toy shop if there's something evil lurking.' I shrugged and looked down when I felt Mr. Prince Charming batting my leg. But I guess this is none of my business. They continued to look at me. I'll be on my way. I gave a slight wave. I'll see ya. The men turned back to the barrel and brought their hands in front of them and carried on their conversation without me eavesdropping. Not only did I need to figure out something about Paul Levy, Yancey Levy was now on my list. What was the loss these men were talking about? And why was Paul seeking revenge? There was nothing about him that told me he was looking for revenge. It was only money, stress. The streets of Azarkaban were filled with all sorts of merchants and their wooden buggy carts. They pushed their wares through the streets, screaming at people to get out of their way. Mr. Prince Charming ran ahead. He stopped and looked back at me. When our eyes met, he turned the corner of the building and darted off, disappearing around it. I hurried to follow him, sticking the book in my bag. When I turned the corner, there it was. A big clue. And I knew exactly what Paul Levy was doing in Whispering Falls. Chapter 20 Dot's was a standalone shop, the outside of which looked like a mini castle. The spires of the castle had yellow round balls on each tip, with yellow and red flags sticking out of each ball. The flags waved high in the air. Dot's was written in black inside a yellow round ball. Could it be? I questioned, stopping in front of the shop to get my head on straight. My intuition curled deep inside of my soul. The yellow balls, the little boy, the toy store, and Paul Levy were all tied together. The ghost boy showed up in Whispering Falls a couple of months ago with a yellow ball. Then Paul Levy shows up. Petunia, I gasped, bringing my hands together. Images of me and Glory Bee played in my head like a movie reel. Petunia's words haunted my soul. She said that Paul Levy knew about how children kept us up at night. The ghost boy and Paul. No. I shook my head, trying to get the thought out. Only it wouldn't leave. The ghost boy had to be Paul Levy's son. He found the boy in Whispering Falls, and the boy— I snapped my fingers. The boy was drawn to Patience because she's a ghost whisperer and more childlike than Constance. Only neither Patience nor the boy knew how to get him to the other side. But why the carnival? Why was Paul pushing for the carnival? And why did my intuition pick up on money? The stress signal was clear. But the money? Hello. The woman stood next to me. Her long black hair lay in waves down to her waist. Her long, thin, pale face made her black eyes and red lips pop. Her long eyelashes seemed to brush over her cheeks. Would you like to come in? Yes. I knew she was Yancey. She didn't need to know why I was there. I already got the answers I was seeking, and now I needed to go back to Patience and have her communicate with the boy. Maybe he had some answers about why Paul would have been murdered. "'Are you looking for something in particular?' she asked. Her long brown cloak swooshed behind her as she walked me up to the toy shop. It was embroidered with orange swirls and yellow dots. It was very lovely, and she was even lovelier. "'I'm looking for a little plastic ball for a little boy.' If I had to go in, I might as well try to get some more information about her. "'You are new to Azarkabam? she asked. I followed her over the drawbridge of the pretend moat. I was totally envious. I'd never seen a toy shop like this one. I'm passing through. I kept it as simple as possible. The inside of the toy shop was amazing. There were three open floors of toys and displays as far as my eyes could see. The right side of the store was interactive. A few children and their parents were milling around. There was a Lego room where children were putting together their own designs. There was a water play area where children were scooping and pouring into different containers. The ball pit was filled with children diving into the squishy fun. Plus, many more rooms I couldn't see. You have a very funny traveling companion. She gestured to Mr. Prince Charming, who had found a nice spot in the middle of the display of yellow balls. 
Yes, I do. I smiled as my familiar confirmed to me that the ghost boy was in fact the son of Yancey and Paul Levy. I guess I'll take one of those. You can never go wrong with a yellow ball. The woman picked up a ball from the pile and held it to her heart. My head swam. I felt dizzy. My intuition engulfed my entire body. The grief of the woman overcame me. Tears dripped from my eyes. "'Are you okay?' she asked. "'Are you?' I asked back. Images of me and Darla rolled around me, images that I had tucked deep inside my memory. "'Darla, I don't want to leave. I want to stay here in Whispering Falls.' My little hand reached up for my mother. "'I know, dear, but your father is no longer here and we need a fresh start.' Darla looked back and smiled. I looked back to see what she was smiling at. Eloise stood on the edge of the woods with her hands folded in front of her. "'We're going to live in Locust Grove, where you can go to school and play with other little girls your age.' She took my hand. "'But I don't want to play with other little girls. I want to play with you and your lotions.' She tugged on my hand. "'I'm fine.' Yancey brought me out of my memory. There was a connection between my memory and— My mouth dropped. Yancey Levy was not a spiritualist, and they were making her clothes shop like Whispering Falls had done to Darla after my spiritualist father had died. I'm in the process of moving, and I hate to leave my shop. She held the ball closer to her chest. I'm just thrilled you'd like a ball. My son loves— She stopped and swallowed. He loved to play with this particular brand. Loved? I knew the answer, but I didn't want to seem insensitive to her. Yes, my son had a terrible childhood illness that took his life a couple of years ago. She walked behind the counter and punched on the cash register. I'm so sorry for your and your husband's lost, I whispered, feeling a little guilty that I couldn't tell her that I had been playing with her son. My husband never got over our son's illness or death. He sort of went a little crazy and was on a mission— She bit her lip. Her black eyes riddled with sadness. He divorced me, and now he's been killed." "'Killed?' I asked, though I already knew. "'I'm so sorry.' She smiled and handed me the ball. "'I have no idea why I'm telling you all this. Take the ball for payment for being my therapist.' "'Oh, no.' I dug deep in my bag to get some money. I pulled out the mojo bag that my intuition had told me to grab before I had left Whispering Falls. "'Let me give you this.' I dangled the cheesecloth bag out in front of me. I'm a homeopathic curist from Locust Grove, Kentucky, and this is a mojo bag with some stress relief. I handed it to her. She took it. I clasped both my hands around hers. I want you to take a bath tonight when you get home. Sprinkle the contents of the bag into the warm water, letting it dissolve completely. Take five deep breaths and then close your eyes. Do not close your eyes when you take the deep breaths. You'll want to, but don't. The bag was going to fill her spirit with happy memories of her child and her husband. It would help her move forward in her life and be able to move away from Azarkaban, like Darla had done. Just talking to you makes me feel better somehow. A tear trickled down her face. Please, take the ball. Thank you. I let go of her hands and took the ball from the counter, sticking it deep within my bag. My phone chirped. I grabbed it and quickly looked. Oscar. June, I cannot believe that you have put Petunia in this situation. I'm coming after you. Suddenly I felt sick. Chapter 21. There was no way I wanted Oscar to come get me. I had gotten the information I had come for and figured out why Paul had come to Whispering Falls. Well, sort of. I knew he had come to find his little boy. But why was the carnival so important? Had someone promised him something if he did bring the carnival? What would that person want from Whispering Falls? My gut told me that when Paul saw the photo of Eloise, he couldn't go through with whatever it was he was sent to do. Had this person promised him his son back? All of these questions floated around in my head. Maybe my time in Azarkaban wasn't over. Maybe the answers to my questions were here. I stepped out of the castle and stood on the drawbridge, looking down the main street of Azarkaban. The old buildings were dark. I had been in a few of them before, and I knew not to go back. There was an old saloon-type bar down on the right. Laughter spilled out into the streets, followed by the tapping of tambourines. A group of fiddlers and women twirling around hooted and hollered, dancing in the street. The women's gold chains that hung around their necks glistened in the dark. The sound of their bangle bracelets jingled along with the clink of the tambourines. They all had long brown hair that hung loosely in large curls around their colorful faces. The men in balloon pants stomped their bare feet on the ground as they yelled out and got down on their fiddles. 
The strings of the bow ran across the fiddle in a shrill tone, as quickly as they could move their hands. The women twirled around the fiddlers, kicking their legs in the air with each pad of their tambourines. They wore pink skirts and gold coin chains dangling from their waist and loose blousy tops draped their top half. They gave me shivers, seeing them dance in the snow-covered streets. I slipped out of sight and into the darkness to keep out of sight. My last interaction with them was not one to be repeated. A hand grabbed my bicep and dragged me into one of the buildings. Another hand clamped around my mouth. Mr. Prince Charming jumped into the air, his claws out. He grabbed onto the person behind me. Ouch! The hand let go of me and the person stumbled backward. I swear that cat hates me. Oscar? My jaw dropped when I recognized him. Mr. Prince Charming sat at my feet. I swear he was smiling. I told you I was coming. He ran his hands down his legs and rubbed out the pain from Mr. Prince Charming's claws. You shouldn't have grabbed me like that. I wanted to laugh because I knew Mr. Prince Charming had wanted to attack Oscar for years, but never had the opportunity. After all, he is my familiar, and part of his job is protecting me from people who want to grab me. I'm your husband. Oscar glared at Mr. Prince Charming. The two stared at each other. You shouldn't have come. I got what I needed and now I'm going back to Whispering Falls. No one knows, so I'm fine. I grabbed him by the hand to get him out of there. No, it's not all fine. His words were sudden, raw and angry. Colton has been looking for you because Mac told him about Eloise's relationship with Paul Levy. He wanted to come get answers from you. Oh. This meant I was really in trouble for breaking my village arrest. So he went to the village president. His words stung me. When he found that Petunia had given you immunity without clearing it with the order of the elders, he arrested her. The Mary showed up and took away her presidency and put her in jail until they find you. I— I was speechless. I never figured my own lawyer would go to Colton. I figured Mac would go and check out the information, giving me time to get to Azarkabam and get the answers. That is the problem. I, I, I. He shook his head and headed down the back alley, keeping in the shadows. When you get into a pickle, it's always I this, I that. You never seem to think how your eyes affect everyone around you. Before I knew it, we were back at the shack. The train was waiting for us. As much as I wanted to tell Oscar what had happened while I was in Azarkabam and how I found out about Paul Levy's child, he was in no mood at the time. It would only make him mad. Plus, I still didn't have the answer to why Paul was murdered. I only had the answers to the ghost boy and who he was, the yellow ball and where it had come from, and the fact that Paul put a spell on Orin that might not ever go away. You are going to go to jail now. I told them I would bring you in. Oscar sat on the velvet bench, disappointment on his face. You have to stay there until the bazaar is over. The bazaar, I gasped, but— No buts. Oscar folded his arms across his chest, rested the back of his head on the glass of the passenger car and closed his eyes. There was no reasoning with Oscar Park when he got mad. I had known this since we were children. He would get mad at me and not talk for days. Unfortunately for him, we were married now and he had to put up with me. Only I knew he wouldn't listen to anything I had to say. I might have had some facts, but nothing got me out of murder. Mr. Prince Charming was curled between us. The sound of the tassels knocking against the glass was steady, like a white noise, putting me to sleep. "'Come on, June,' Darla's voice called between the sounds of ringing chimes and gonging bells. "'I want a caramel apple!' I pointed to the lady in the pointy hat, walking around the carnival that had come to town. She had a sweet smile. Her teeth were so white. I was eyeing the tray of apples on sticks that were neatly dripped in hardened caramel. My taste buds were watering. "'You know you cannot have any sugary treats,' Darla insisted. I never eat the bad stuff, as she called it. That was where my addiction to ding-dongs had begun. Oscar's Uncle Jordan always bought those yummy treats, and Oscar and I would eat an entire box, sitting under the big tree in his front yard. But it's a carnival. I really wanted one of those apples. No. Darla wasn't budging. She bent down and looked at me. You stay right here. I'm going to go look at that booth. I watched as she walked off to look at some homeopathic booth. Would you like an apple? The woman approached me, her smile so inviting. Go on, have one. She shoved the tray in my face. My mouth watered even more. I reached out to grab the big stick attached to one. No! Darla smacked my hand away from the tray. When I looked up to see the woman's reaction, she was gone. Darla jerked my hand, and without another word she dragged me home. June? Oscar shook me awake. Did you just have another nightmare? I opened my eyes. 
The train had come to a stop, and we were in the wheat field. No, I swallowed the dream. More like a memory. The mojo bag I had given to Yancey was probably for me, but it was too late. I had already given it to her. Memories? Oscar looked concerned. He drew me close to him. Just memories of Darla. I let him snuggle me. I took a deep breath and let my body curl into his. Tomorrow I wouldn't be waking up next to him. I'd be waking up in the jail. Not where I wanted to wake up, but at least I knew I was safe there. I shivered. The cold chill that had woken me up a couple of days ago had found its way back into my soul. This time my heart beat with fright. The evil was getting closer, yet I was no closer to figuring out what was going on. Chapter 22 Whispering Falls was wide awake in the middle of the night. It was as if everyone had come out to see me being dragged off to jail. Animals from the woods were gathered outside looking into the windows of the police station. The fireflies buzzed around, darting about in an angry fashion. "'June, we will figure this out,' Izzy assured me when I walked into the police station. "'We know you had good reason to leave.' "'And I'll figure that out,' Max said. "'Oscar?' "'I hate this,' he teared up. "'You are my wife. This isn't right for me to be putting you in jail when I should be taking you home.' "'Just as long as you know I didn't do it,' I whispered, and took a step forward to the steel door of the jail cell Colton was holding for me. I handed my bag to Oscar and he set it down on his desk. The jail only had one cell in the back of the police station, and I was happy to see Petunia was my roommate. She sat on one of the twin beds, cross-legged. She didn't look at me. She kept her head down. "'Your animals are here to support you.' I tried to make her feel better. Once everyone gave us peace, I'd tell her what I'd discovered in his arquebam, hoping she'd be able to help me shed some light on the situation. She crossed her arms and turned toward the wall. I guess I have to go. Oscar's hands gripped the cell bars. Colton shut the door and locked it. Good night, June. I love you. I love you. I smiled, trying to reassure him that everything was going to be okay. Colton rushed everyone out but Mac. Tell me what this was all about, Mac asked his pen and paper at the ready. I'm tired. I pushed my hair out of the way. I just want to go to bed. I sat down on the mattress. Can't we do this tomorrow? Tomorrow is the bazaar, and there will be so many people in our village. It would be better to get your statement tonight, he said. There is no statement. I tricked Petunia into giving me immunity and I ran. I shrugged, plain and simple. I don't believe you. Colton stepped up to the cell. His blue eyes fell upon me. I think you were trying to find something. Well, I didn't. I lay down on the bed and crossed my ankles and my arms. I closed my eyes. It seemed like forever until Mac left us alone. Petunia was still silent. I'm going to go ask Eloise some questions. I'll be back. Colton looked at us. Petunia didn't move, and neither did I. Though I did wonder why he couldn't wait until the morning to talk to Eloise. When I heard him lock the police station door, I sat up. Petunia, I know you don't want to talk to me, but you have to listen. It was time to tell her about my trip to Azarkabam and maybe get some insight from her. She didn't move. She just stayed looking at the wall. Just listen. I sat on the edge of the bed. I think I got some good stuff. Paul and his wife Yancey, his mortal wife, I emphasized mortal, own a local toy shop in Azarkabam. Oh, you'd love it. It's this big castle with all sorts of— I ran my hand over my face. I'll stick to the facts. She was obviously in no mood to hear about dots. They had a son who died of a childhood illness. Paul was so grief-stricken that he never got over it. Yancey is now having to move out of their village since he's no longer alive. Here's why he came to Whispering Falls. When I saw Petunia perk up a little I continued because I knew she was listening. You know that yellow ball that is all over town? She didn't budge. Well, that ball belongs to a little ghost boy that has been bugging Patience, but not Constance. Constance insists that Patience is going nuts and giggling to herself, but the ghost boy is making Patience laugh. He's keeping her company. The boy, I sucked in a deep breath, is Paul Levy's son. How do you know that? Petunia jumped around. Her messy updo flipped to the right and then to the left. A bag of peanuts fell out. She reached down and picked them up, holding them out to me. I took it as a peace offering and got up. I walked over to her bed and sat down. Dots, Paul's shop, is inspired by this yellow ball. They even sell them there. I pointed toward my bag. I have one in there to show you. Yancey gave one to me. You told her? Petunia's face looked mortified. 
No, I assured her and took a handful of peanuts. I gave her a mojo bag in exchange. How is this going to exactly help us? she asked. Paul was obviously here to look for his son, and someone has promised him something if he was to get the carnival here. I chewed on the peanuts as well as my words. Paul saw my picture of Eloise on the wall of my shop when he came in here. I still couldn't reconcile the fact my intuition said he was surrounded by money and stress. He couldn't go through with whatever the person wanted him to do in exchange. For the life of his son, Petunia's eyes lit up. What on earth does bringing a carnival here have to do with all this? That is the million-dollar question, and one I don't have the answer to. I let out a heavy sigh. Being in here isn't going to help us solve it, either. I looked out through the bars and out the window into the pitch-black darkness of Whispering Falls. Tomorrow the streets would be filled with tourists and a carnival, a carnival that held the answers I needed. I shivered. Are you okay? Petunia's tone was frost. Chapter 23 Something woke me up into my reality, somewhere I didn't want to be. I glanced over and Petunia was asleep, curled on her side. Outside was half dark, half light. The silhouettes of Petunia's animals told me they were still outside waiting for her. The day was beginning without me. I pulled the thin blanket up over my shoulders, trying to forget where I was. The sound of something dragging across the floor echoed inside of the police station. I sat up. My bag was trying to get through the bars of the cell, but couldn't make it through. Get it. Petunia jumped to her feet and pointed to my bag. Good morning, I greeted her. I did what she said and reached over. The bag jerked back, away from me, out of reach. The yellow ball shot out like a cannon and bounced a few times. The boy is here, I said, and watched as the ball bounced up and down in a rhythmic motion, as though someone was bouncing it up and down. Hi there, I said into the air. Petunia looked at me as if I had lost my mind. I'm June, with the cat. And I met your mommy. The ball stopped. It rolled toward the bars. And I love your toy shop. I bet that was exciting growing up around. I walked closer to the ball. Your mommy gave me this ball. I reached out to get the ball. It shot away and started to bounce again. We, I gestured between Petunia and me, need your help. I'm sure you saw your daddy at Patience's house. I talked as though I knew what was going on. Truth of the matter, I was not a ghost spiritualist and had no idea what I was doing. The ball stopped. I need you to get patience and tell her I need to talk to her. I can help you, I told him. The ball dropped to the ground. Hello? I asked. Are you still here? Great. Petunia's voice dripped with unhappiness. You scared him off. I'm doing the best I can. I turned toward her. The best you can got my son and husband taken from me. She plopped down on the bed. The door opened. Colton walked in. Good morning. Colton had his hands full of coffee and a bag from Wicked Good. I come with food. It was nice that Colton was trying to be kind to us, but that was not what we needed. We had to get out of there. He handed us each a coffee and the bag through the bars. Where did this come from? He asked and picked up the ball. He also picked up my bag. There wasn't any funny stuff going on here. No, Petunia and I said together. Unfortunately, you two are going to have to hang out here while I walk around the bazaar and make sure everything is okay. I had to take Oscar off the case and told him not to come by until we get through the day. He put the ball and the bag back on his desk. He said he'd work in your shop while Faith opened up Glory Be for you. Petunia nodded. There wasn't anyone who could take care of her animals more than her. Not that your animals want to go back to the shop, but I've got to corral them if you can't get them to go back. Colton had warned. Petunia threw her head back. Her mouth opened. Ba, ba. Her head peaked the air. Ka, ka, ka. Her voice was shrill and loud. The animals perked up, restless. Some pawed the window, but within minutes they had left and made their way back to Glory Bee. Thank you, Colton said. Did you go see Eloise? I asked, curious. June, you need to worry about your case. Colton wasn't going to give me any information. The stark reality was that I was on my own, and dragging Petunia down with me. We sat there taking our time eating our breakfast and drinking our coffee in silence. The streets were filling up with people moving about. The shops had opened earlier with special hours, and the carnival was doing exactly what Paul Levy said they would do. There were balloon artists surrounded by children, there were jugglers keeping others entertained. The bazaar looked like it was going to be a success. I was happy to see everyone enjoying the day, but itching to get out. Look at that, 
Petunia pointed to a little dog with a little coat on. It was on a leash and a family was walking him. I bet they're going to my shop. Her voice held sadness. I'm sorry, I apologized. Maybe it was time to give in. I don't know where I went wrong. I'm sorry for bringing you down with me. I don't know how, but I will make this up to you. She didn't look at me. She just laughed at the little dog until her laughter stopped as if a valve shut it off. June! She gasped. She pointed. My eyes drew down her arm and out the window where her finger was pointing. Patience's ostrich was erratically running about, pecking anyone and everything it could. It grabbed the wreath off the carriage light outside of the police station. The wreath bounced in the air and, like a ring toss, landed around the ostrich's neck. The yellow ball was sitting as still as could be on the back of the ostrich. The boy's spirit, Petunia's words were haunting. He wants to come back as the ostrich. My mouth dropped. I had it all wrong. The ostrich is fighting the boy's spirit. It's confused and doesn't understand. Petunia stood up and closed her eyes. She lifted her hands out in front of her. Maba tricta swignamba, she chanted out into the air. Her head lifted back. The chanting got louder. My eyes scanned between her and the unruly ostrich. The ostrich calmed. Its neck craned to look into the window. The ball Yancey had given me started to bounce. If you would like me to help you become the ostrich, you must help us. Petunia brought her hands together. Her words were barely audible. Get the keys and kick them in here. The keys lifted off of Oscar's desk and slid across the floor. Good boy. Petunia's chest heaved up when she took a deep breath. She looked over at me and smiled. You had it all wrong. This boy has been here to come back in the spirit of the ostrich, not here to play with patience. The ostrich is just like a child, runs around, doesn't listen, likes to play. She smiled. Now we have keys to get out. You don't have to do this, I said. You can stay here and I'll tell them that I blackmailed you. You need to get back to your family. Baby Orin needs you. Whispering Falls needs you, June. She bent down and took the keys. She reached around the bars and unlocked the cell door, flinging it open. Let's go. Chapter 24 Instead of going out the front door, we headed out the back, but not without me taking Oscar's Whispering Falls police uniform and putting it on. Petunia was going to slip out into the woods. The animals would keep her safe until I figured out what evil was lurking in the carnival. I made my way behind the shops and walked between the gathering grove and mystic lights. Patience was standing in the middle of the street, looking down and then up. "'Get back here!' she screamed as the ostrich ran past her. The ball was still on the back of the creature. I took a step out to the street when a carnival worker stepped up and stopped Patience. "'I know you would like a nice, warm caramel apple.' The hand of the carnival worker was that of a woman. Patience smiled and clapped her hands together. "'My friend June was going to get me one, but I'll take yours.' Patience's hand lifted to get an apple. Panic welled in my throat. As the images of me and Darla at the carnival in Locust Grove focused into my memory, a terrifying realization washed over me. The woman holding the apples was the same woman who tried to give me one as a child. No! I ran up to them and smacked Patience's hand away. June Heal. The woman's red lips curled up on the ends. Evil exuded from her entire body. The darkest laughter soaked the air around us. The woman's clothes turned into a cloak and veil. A black onyx jewel dangled down her forehead. I warned you that I'd be back. She drew the cloak around her and a flash of light and thunder sent me falling to the ground. Esmeralda. I leaned on my arm and looked up. She was gone. My bag! I jumped up, bumping into the crazy ostrich, stumbling up the street and into the police station. Esmeralda was behind this and there was only one thing she wanted, the ultimate spell. The ultimate spell would help Esmeralda take over the spiritual world, making it all darksider and evil. Darla, I whispered, grabbing my bag off the desk. My bag lit up. I pulled Madame Torres out. The onyx ring that I had taken from Esmeralda the last time we had met, the ring that gave her most of her power, floated inside Madame Torres. It was in the top drawer of Colton's desk. I grabbed my bag and put it over my shoulder. Stop right there, Colton warned from behind me. Colton! I was never so glad to see a wand pointed at me. Esmeralda's back and she's trying to get my book, trying to get the ring. We both looked next to the desk. The yellow ball bounced up and down. June? 
Colton kept the wand pointed at me. Get back in the cell and let me do my job. You've done enough damage for this village. You don't get it, I protest. She's going to kill us all. Get back in the cell. Colton started to walk closer. The ball rolled under Colton's feet, causing him to trip over it. His wand skidded across the floor. I picked it up. I'm sorry, Colton. I opened the desk drawer and took the ring. The ball bounced out the back and I followed with the ring and the magical cures book in my hand. The boy was helping me. I wasn't sure why, but I followed him and led him. The deeper we went into the woods, the further I moved into the world of the Darksiders. It was something I had never done, but I knew I had to. No doubt in my mind that Colton had already gotten to Oscar and told him what I had done. Help! The voice off in the distance was Petunia. Help! The ball darted ahead of me and I ran as fast as I could. The ball hovered in the air, showing me the way, until I reached her. Petunia was surrounded by raccoons, squirrels, and deer. "'June!' she yelled in a breathy voice. "'Esmeralda's here. She's put me in a fortress. My animals can't help me. She said she's here to take over.' The ostrich bolted forward. The ball bounced on its back. "'Paul Levy's spirit found the opening for the ostrich,' Petunia said. "'The boy and his father are united. Only the boy will always be a spirit with the ostrich. Neither will leave the other.' My mind was having a hard time wrapping around all of Petunia's words. "'You are right. I'm back.' A bolt of lightning came from the sky, sending Esmeralda down in front of me. "'And I need those.' She uncurled her long finger and curled it open and closed for me to give the ring and grimoire to her. "'Over my dead body,' I said through gritted teeth and held the items close to my body. "'Oh, if you insist.' Esmeralda brought her hand into the air. I closed my eyes, ready to take the blow. "'Mother, stop!' Arabella rushed over to my side. "'You will not do this!' My bag warmed against my body. "'I'm doing this for you. Us. Our family,' Esmeralda spat, her words vicious to the ear. "'You are not my family,' Arabella, immediately disowning Esmeralda, caught her mother off guard. "'You have been poisoned. You will see once I get my ring and control the spiritual world.' She lifted her hand. "'Stop!' Arabella walked up and stood between her mother and me. I'll go with you. I'll help you if you let them go. No. I shook my head. Don't you dare make a deal with her, I warned her. Let me take it for the world. I am the chosen one. It would be a pleasure, Esmeralda threw her head back and laughed. The heat from my bag caused me to look. Madame Torres was glowing bright with a field full of blood mercy flowers. My hand rose to my hair. I had forgotten I had stuck it in my hair for an accessory. I pulled it out, remembering the water and waves Madame Torres had shown me. With the flower pointed at Esmeralda, I cracked the stem. Water flew out toward her. No! Esmeralda screamed in pain. Not blood mercy! Arabella! She reached for her daughter. Arabella turned her head away from her mother as her mother's being disintegrated into a puddle of black tar before us. Chapter 25 Order? Order. The Marys hammered their gavels on the gathering rock to get everyone's attention. Order! they yelled in unison. Tell us exactly what you know, June. Petunia, Gerald, and Eloise had all given their testimony to what they knew of Paul Levy. Now it was my turn to tell them exactly what had happened. I walked in front of the Marys and took a deep breath. I could feel the love of my villagers behind me giving me strength. It's simple, really. Paul Levy's son died of a childhood illness. The death crippled Paul and he would do anything to get his son back, and selling his soul to Esmeralda was his ticket. She was looking for a way to get back into Whispering Falls to get the ring and the magical cures book with the ultimate spell. She made a deal with Paul, only Paul knew that he had to get in the bazaar by going through the village president. When he saw that Petunia wasn't sleeping, he offered her a deal any mother would take. Only baby Orin had to suffer through the mustache. I glanced back at Petunia. As soon as Esmeralda melted, the mustache disappeared from baby Orin, breaking the spell Paul had put on him. The ghost boy who almost ruined my wedding was here because he loved the ostrich. When Paul decided not to go through with the deed tasked to him by Esmeralda after he saw my photo of Eloise in my shop, Esmeralda followed him to the woods, killing him and making it look like I did it. I pointed to Constance Karima. The autopsy shows that Paul had a strike to the heart, which is Esmeralda's specialty. One blow from her hand and you die. The crowd behind me gasped. As Petunia told you, Esmeralda confessed to coming back to take over the spiritual world. 
I had been named the Chosen One. I lived up to my title by killing Esmeralda. Now I just want to be Oscar Park's wife and owner of a charming cure, live a simple life in Whispering Falls. I smiled at Oscar. He stood next to the gathering rock with his Whispering Falls police uniform on. There was pride on his face. I love you, he mouthed. The Marys gathered in a circle, floating above the rock. They talked among themselves. I wasn't sure what their verdict would be, and I wasn't sure what my punishment was going to be. All I knew was that I was Oscar's wife, and I had fulfilled my destiny as the Chosen One. The Marys floated down and landed square on their feet. Mary Ellen smacked the gavel on the gathering rock. Here, by the order of the elders, we hereby sentence you to a week-long honeymoon. Upon your arrival home, you will resume all duties as the owner of a charming cure, and wifely duties to Sheriff Oscar Park. The crowd behind me erupted in hoots and hollers. Oscar swept me off my feet and swung me around. I love you. I gave him little kisses all over his face. Honeymoon! Oscar threw his head back and laughed. Finally! He set me back on the ground. Where are we going to go? Somewhere sunny and not in the spiritual world. I grinned from ear to ear. I could already feel the warm sand between my toes. This has been A Charming Ghost, a Magical Cures Mystery Series, Volume 8. Written by Tanya Kappas. Narrated by Karen Savage. Copyright 2016 by Tanya Kappas. Production Copyright 2018 by Tanya Kappas.